You want to do a quick, s oh, okay. We still have like two minutes, so. Does that sound okay? Is it, no, no feedback, okay. Uh, if you're waiting, by the way, you might want to download up updated course material. They did a dry run of this tutorial, I don't know, last, last Friday, made a few edits to it. So the, uh, uh, the printed notes are pretty close to what I'm going to present, but there's some, you know, it's been improved a little bit. So uh, go ahead and download the improved version. So. Hey, none of, none, of, none of that, John. <laughs> yeah, I plan on, I plan on doing that, yeah. All right, I'm showing exactly 9 o'clock, so I'm going to start. So good morning. Welcome to the Generators tutorial. I'm Dave, if you haven't figured that out. Um, this is probably the tutorial for you if you think the Star Wars movies start with Return of, like, 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 uh, like Revenge of the Jedi or the third one there. Um, um, uh, this, is, this is actually the third part of a, uh, a trilogy, so to speak. Um, so I give a, a Generator tutorial. Um, 2008 Generator Tricks for Systems Programmers at PyCon. Uh, it's something that's pretty widely known. We might have encountered that uh, online somewhere. Basically, this leap into generator functions and what they're used for. Um, that was actually followed up a year later by this, um, this, this is my ode to the 70s TV, you know, TV, <laughs> 80s TV there. Um, followed up by this, uh, this course on uh, coroutines, concurrency. Uh, kind of saying, hey, there's, there's actually more to iteration than generators. Um, this tutorial is part three, which is probably everything that you didn't even know that you could do with generators. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how to really describe it, but it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of new techniques with, with generators. Uh, I sort of got the idea for doing this tutorial after um, working on the, the Python cookbook update, sort of realized, hey, there's some other stuff with generators that I didn't know you could do. It would be kind of fun to do a tutorial on it. Um, as far as requirements, for this, you actually need Python 3.4 or preferably newer to do the, um, <laughs> the uh, tutorial. Um, doesn't, doesn't require any third-party extensions. Uh, you can get all the code from that URL. So follow along if you want. Um, this is not uh, really a heavily hands-on tutorial. I'm not going to give you a project and say, hey, go hack on this. So uh, it's, it's perfectly fine to kind of follow along if you want. Uh, as far as disclaimer, I would say this is fairly advanced. Um, I assume that you know Python language features. You know about iterators, generators. You know about things like decorators, common programming patterns. It's not a, it's not a, not a basic tutorial. Uh, one disclaimer is um, I learned a ton preparing this tutorial. I don't, I, that, that can either serve as a warning or <laughs> something. I mean, it sort of, um, it, it kind of blew my mind uh, preparing this. I'm actually a little bit worried that I'm going to get into the middle of this and just seize up and realize that I don't know what I'm talking about. So, uh, so there is that. Um, the other, the other thing, um, you know, saying that this is part three, you could, you could say, well, I'm not going to be lost in here if I didn't see the other tutorials. Um, I would say no. Um, this is a pretty standalone thing um, that we're going to do, but just uh, be aware that it's not the complete picture. 
So there's certain things that we're not going to talk about that you're not going to get in here. So, so be aware of that. Um, also, the, the other thing about this tutorial, um, this is probably not something that you're going to take back to work and start applying unless you want to get fired. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean we're, we're kind of way out on some bleeding edge topics in, in the Python world. I mean, first of all, like Python 3, how many people are using Python 3.4? I mean, okay, that's like two more than last year on Python 3. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it's way out, way out in the future. Um, I would say it's, it's going to be more thought provoking than anything. So, keep, keep that in mind. So, uh, so just to jump into this. Um, I'm going to do a quick review of some basics of generators and, and coroutines. Um, can't come to Canada without having a slide on Rush, of course. So, you know, I'm going to have that. So, um, so, some generator 101. Any function that you write in Python that uses a yield statement is a generator function. Like, if you write this uh, countdown function, you say yield n in there, turns into this kind of, you know, magic, magic function, doesn't behave like the rest. Typically, what's used, uh, what you do for that is to feed for loops. You feed iteration. Okay, so what happens is the yield statement just kind of spits out values, and then it feeds for loops. So this is uh, a fairly, a fairly well-known idea. Um, underneath the covers, I mean, the way that this works is if you create a countdown object, or you say countdown, it makes this generator object, and then to f to drive it, you basically call next on it a whole bunch of times, and then it sort of goes on until, you, until it falls off the end, and then you get a stop iteration exception. So this is, um, this is a fairly well-known concept. I mean, generators have been around in Python, I think, I think since 2.3, maybe 2.4, something like that. They've been around a while. Um, and all I would really say about that is that if that is all you know about generators, that they feed for loops, you're, you're missing probably like 95% of the picture of what's possible, okay? It's, um, there's, there's way more to it. Than, than just the yield statement. Um, one of the more advanced things that you can do um, with generators, um, this, is, this, this is something that I think is really cool, is using generators to set up processing pipelines. This is something that was explored in that earlier tutorial. Is, is the idea is if you just have a for loop sitting at the end and then you have some input sequence on the front, you can sort of stack up generator functions and do things like data flow processing and pipelining, all sorts of big, big data processing stuff. Really cool idea. We're not going to talk about that here, though. Um, another, um, another thing that gets a little wild is the idea that you can actually use the yield statement to, um, to receive values. I mean, this is a little bit lesser known. In case you've never, never seen that before, let me, um, let me just like, do, a, do a demo of that. Um, you, can, you can write a function. Like, you can say, oh, here's, here's my function spam. And then you can just drop the thing into an infinite while loop, like item equals yield. print got item, you know, so, something like that. Um, what, what this is, is if you, if you call that function, it creates a generator object because it uses the yield, um, but it's not really producing, producing values. Um, well, the way that you use that is you, you make it advance to the yield statement, and then you send in stuff. It's like a function that sort of stays alive and just receives messages sent to it. Okay, so that's, um, that's another, you know, another example of thing. Yeah, a question up here. That oh, that works, yeah, that works in 2.7. Two um, that's actually, this, this is the coroutine feature. It's, it's been around since Python 2.5. I would say it's not as widely known as the other use of generators, the fact that you could just make a function and like send, uh, send stuff into it, so. Uh, so yeah, it's been been around for a while, but you can you can you can send things in. Little little weird that the way that 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 works. Um, one of the things that you can do with that, by the way, is do things like um, like data flow processing kinds of things, publish subscribe, event simulation, and so forth. You can actually make like little coroutines, and they all like hook together. And they like send things to each other, and do interesting things. I'm not going to talk about that either, because that was in the other the second tutorial from from earlier. But just kind of know that that's that that's possible. Um, and as far as just some, some basic fundamentals concerning this yield statement, it turns out that there's a fair amount of stuff sort of surrounding that, okay? So, so first of all, any function whatsoever that uses a yield turns into a, a generator function. The behavior is different. So if you, if you have any function at all and you stick a yield in there anywhere, 
it will, will turn into a generator. What that means is that when you call the function, it's not actually going to execute. It's going to return this generator object back. Once you have one of those things, there's a few operations that you can do. Um, the next operation will advance the code to the yield statement and then emit the value that was produced if there is one. Okay, so next is, is essentially advancing it. Turns out that that's the only thing that you can do on a generator that has just been started. So if you call one of these functions, next is the only thing that you can do. Uh, you can send something into a generator. What this does is it essentially makes the yield statement return a value. Okay, so whatever you send in comes back from the yield, and then the code will actually run until it hits the next yield, and then whatever value it emits is what comes back from the send method. So, uh, so send, it's, 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 it, you're sort of saying, okay, here's something, go work on it, run until you get to the next, next yield. You can close a generator. This is also something little known, but if you, if you have one of these things running, you can just call close on it, and it will actually raise an exception at the yield statement. It's a way of signaling that, hey, you're shutting down when you clean up. So you can, you can do that. Um, you can also um, throw an exception at the yield statement. So if you, if you have a generator here and you say, okay, go run to the yield, if you do this throw operation, it will result in an exception popping out of the yield statement. And then that code can respond to it in, in some way. Um, just to keep in mind, all of these features are actually available in Python 2.5 that I've mentioned so far. So like close and send and next and, and, and throw, th those, those have actually been, been around for a while. And they were, they were sort of covered in some of the earlier, earlier tutorials. Turns out that there's some other newer stuff, though, that is lesser known. Um, so one of the things that's new is the behavior of what happens when a generator returns. So it turns out that in Python 3, you can actually have a yield statement and a return statement mixed at the same time in, a, in code. This is actually a syntax error in Python 2, but in Python 3, uh, it's allowed. And there's some, some kind of interesting behavior with that. Um, let's say you have a function spam where you yielded a value like 42, and then you returned a value like, uh, you know, like Monty or something. Um, Keep in mind, Python 2, that is a syntax error. In Python 3, it is allowed. The behavior of that is kind of odd, actually. Um, what will happen is if you, if you call that, it will come up and say, oh, you're a, a generator object, which means that you can do things like call next on it. You just lose the, okay. Good. So it means you, you, can call, you can call next on it. And you'll see the, the 42 pop out of it. It says, okay, there's 42. If you call next again, you get this question of like, well, what happens now? I see a return statement in there, but what's going to happen? Um, what will happen is the code will raise a stop iteration exception, and it turns out that the value of the exception is actually the thing that was returned. It's kind of a weird roundabout way of returning a value, but uh, the, re the return value comes back with the exception. Again, this is, this is a Python 3 feature it will become in more important later. I'll just leave it, uh, leave it at that. So there's a, you can return values doing generators. Um, and then another um, feature of Python 3 is the ability to delegate to a generator. This is this um, yield from statement. So this is something that, that uh, was added, I believe, in PEP 380. First showed up in Python 3.4, or 3.2, and it, what, it, what it does is it allows you to, to essentially delegate to another generator function or do the work of iteration or, have, or basically you just, you just hand it off to somebody else. Um, since many people have probably never seen that in any capacity, I thought I would do um, kind, of a, kind of an interesting little demo with that. So here, here's an example of, of this delegation feature. I'm going to write a function chain xy where I just say yield from x yield from y and nothing else. And you can say, well, what in the, like, what does that do? Well, here's, here's, a, here's an example of what it might do. Is let, let's say you had four, like, let's say you had two lists like that. And then I said for n in chain a, b, print n. What you'll find is it actually just ended up stringing the two sequences together. So what, what happened here, the yield from x 
essentially took the A and it just said, oh, I'm just going to consume that and spit out the values. So it just spit out the one, two, three. And then the yield from Y, um, you still okay on the audio? Hearing it drop out occasionally. Okay, so the yield from Y essentially consumes B and it spits those out. So, um, so what you're getting is, is it, it kind of strung those, those two things together. And you, you didn't actually have to worry about it at all. You didn't, have to, you didn't have to do a for loop or anything. It just said, oh yeah, just, just, just produce that. Um, it turns out it, it gets even sort of wilder than that because you can do things like for n in chain of a, like you could actually nest these things. Like, well, let's, let's do a chain of chain of a, b, chain of like b and b. So like, okay, that, that looks insane, whatever that's gonna do. Um, and it's like, it, it, essentially that works as well. I mean, what's, what's happening is you're, you're just, it's, it's just delegating iteration down to whatever it is. And you'll actually find that this yield from allows you to do things like stack generators up on top of each other. And they just magically sort of, sort of work. Again, if, you're, if your mind is sort of blown by that a little bit, it's only a small taste of what's about to happen. So I have to warn you about that, but it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of cool that, that, that yield from. So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. But as a, as a little mini reference, um, here's, here's kind of the guide to generators. Essentially, use yield to make a generator function. In yield, you can have a result. Um, and then you have these core operations that sit underneath the covers that let you drive it. You can either advance to the yield, you can send it a value, you can close it, you can throw an exception, or you can do this delegation, delegation stuff. So think of these as kind of the, the, the I don't know, the, the building blocks of generators, uh, if you will, and you can do some pretty neat things with that. So that's sort of a, that's sort of a starting point. Um, I will pause for questions. Let me just pause, see whether it's, there's any like general questions about that before we, before we move on. I'll try to, uh, try to address it. Okay. Question here. I'll, I'll repeat the question too, so the, for the mic. Going here. back to the yield from, is the, is the yield from the X yield from Y other than like one four three five? If I'd said, um, oh, if I said yield from. No, actually, yeah, that's actually a good observation. Like, if I had said, uh, I'll, I'll do this chain two x y. If I had said yield x, yield y, like like that, and then said for like n and chain two a b, um, it it actually would have produced just the x and the y. I mean, it's 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 it kind of what's going on with the chain function is that it's actually running the iteration for you. Like um, the yield from is he sent? Well, okay botch that there. Um, the, yield, the yield from is, is essentially running the iteration for you. Like, like this, this is actually what's going on um, behind the yield from is that. It's, it's essentially saying, well, okay, you don't need to do the for loops. I can just take care of that for you. So that, that's actually what it's doing. Although it's actually doing a lot more than that as we'll get to, uh, get to later there. So, so that's, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a starting a starting point. Now, what I'm going to do at this point is take you in a completely different direction. I mean, like what most people sort of think of yield, and they say, eh, it's iteration, it's, it's for loops, and, uh, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, instead of doing that, I want to start with this programming pattern. Um, you've probably seen this sort of programming before. Open a file, close a file. Acquire a lock, release a lock, start a transaction, commit a transaction. Um, super common programming style. Turns out it's th that this is the basis of the with statement. Context managers, okay? So uh, if, if you've seen this in Python, uh, you have the with statement. Essentially lets you do things like acquire a lock, release a lock. Very elegant, elegant technique. Um, turns out that there's a, a really cool way to make your own context manager using this context manager decorator. Um, it, it looks a little bit weird, but um, what, you, what you could do is, is write a function like this. You could say, oh, this is a context manager, time this, you know, calculate a start time, yield statement, calculate an end time. And, and it turns out that this will, this is what, what's happening here is a context manager for timing a, like a statement block. 
you would say, oh, with time this, put a block in there and it would report a time. Here's, a, here's another example of context, uh, that context manager thing. Um, temporary directories. You could do things like, oh, let's, let's make a temporary directory. And we use like this yield statement and then remove the directory. Uh, this, this is something that will it'll, like, make a directory. You can do stuff with it and then it gets deleted. Now, if you look at that, what, what is going on with the yield statement in this code? I mean, if you've never seen this before, or even if you have seen it before, you've got this yield sitting there, what is the purpose of that and what is going on? Because it's, not, it's clearly not iterating, and it's not some data flow problem like with coroutines or something like that. It's not a concurrency trick. I mean, what in the world is going on with the, with the yield? It's a, it's a generator, but uh, what, what's happening there? So this is actually kind of, kind of interesting because you're using the yield to do something completely different underneath the covers. And, and what is really going on here is that if you know how the with statement works, um, it allows you to kind of monitor entry and exit from a code block. Like when you say with object, what it does is it invokes an enter method and then you run a whole bunch of statements, and then it invokes an exit method. And the way that you, that you define a context manager normally is by creating an object. You actually define a class where you say, this is a manager. You have an enter method on it where you, you're allowed to return a value. And then you have an exit method where you um, can either ignore or handle an exception if you want. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the prototype for context managers to do, to do that. And... Here's, a, here's an example of, of maybe temporary directories with a, with a class. Like if I wanted to do temporary directories, what I would do in the enter method is essentially say, hey, okay, make a temporary directory, return the directory name, and then the exit method, I would remove the directory, just do a, do a cleanup on it. So what is happening with that decorator, the context manager decorator, is it's a reformulation of code. It's, it's essentially that code, but it's been reformulated or glued together in a different sort of way. And the big picture of what is happening with that is essentially the yield statement being used as a knife or a pair of scissors in a way. Um, what, what you're actually doing is that context, that, that generator function is being cut in half by the yield statement. And what is happening is the two different halves are being mapped to the enter and the exit method of the context manager. So you're, you're taking that code, slicing it in half, um, and you're, you're doing something like this. So everything before the yield is going to be the enter, and everything after the yield is going to be the exit. And yield is sort of, you know, it's kind of the magic making that, making that possible, but behind the, uh, behind the scenes of what, what is happening there is there essentially there's a, there's a class, kind of some kind of wrapper class, where you hand it a generator function as input, and then there's a decorator which is feeding this class. So it turns out that what that, that context manager decorator is doing is it's starting the function, and then it's immediately throwing it into this, this class that has the enter and the exit method on it. And then what those, what those methods are doing is essentially running the generator. Okay, so in the enter method, you invoke next, you essentially say, hey, crank the gen, like move the generator forward so I can get past the yield statement and return the value back. And then, um, and then in the exit method, there's a whole mess of, of stuff there. Um, it turns out that, that, that what happens in exit is you have to monitor the, the, the return, like the, the arguments here and say, well, if there's no exception pending, meaning this exception type is none, you basically call next and just say, hey, just run. If there's a pending exception, you throw an exception inside the generator. And then there's some other things that, that, that happen here as well. There's like an exception to make sure the thing stops. Um, this little bit at the bottom has to do with error handling in, inside the code. I don't, I don't necessarily want to get into all the details of that, um, but um, that's, kind of, that's kind of what's what's going on behind the scenes. This, this code, it's essentially running that generator function on your behalf and mapping it, uh, you know, mapping it to this, to this object. Um, just just, just in, in the interest of full disclosure, the actual implementation of this has to deal with some really tricky, nasty corner cases. I mean, actually, if you pull up the code for that, let me see if I can do this. Um, 
like if you if you import like look at that context manager um, that context manager code um, and and just kind of poke around um, there's some there's some really kind of nasty stuff in there like um, like I'm pretty sure that this is the the code for that. I mean, like this exit method, it's, there's a whole bunch of different cases with like handling errors, instantiating types, you know, and there's a lot of comments, you know, like, you know, suppress the exception unless it's the exception that was passed to throw. And like, it's like, it, this, this will sort of make your head explode if you try to like fully like comprehend every corner case that goes on. But that's kind of, that's kind of the gist of the idea there is that the yield is being used in a different way. It's being used as, as, a, as a knife or a pair of scissors or something where you're, you're taking that, that generator function and you're kind of reformulating control flow with it. Um, I think the ultimate goal of it is actually to make it easier for people to write context manager. Like it's not just a sort of a, like a gratuitous exercise in job security or something. I mean, it's like, you know, they're trying, the, the whole idea is that you can, you can easily make a context manager using that. You don't have to worry about kind of like you know, underlying mechanics of context manager. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, the picture of that. Now, other reasons for starting with this example will become clear in a second, though. But let me just pause, see whether there's questions about what happened there. Does everybody kind of see that the yield is kind of, it's like chopped that function in half, essentially? All right. It's either stunned looks or, uh, okay, we'll see. Um, now, of course, there's more to this. I mean, otherwise, if I ended the tutorial, I mean, it'd be kind of, kind of <laughs> disappointment. So, um, so we're gonna, we're going to take this in a slightly different um, di direction here. Um, do pe people know who Carly Rae Jepsen is? The, uh, <laughs> yeah, this happened in my at my dry run. I had this slide in reference to the the Call Me Maybe video with like a half a billion views on YouTube and like nobody had ever heard of it before. So, um, so, so uh, Canadian pop, this is my reference to Canadian pop singer. Um, I, I decided since this didn't work, I would replace the photo with this one, um, <laughs> which is sort of, um, it's gonna be kind of appropriate because what we're, what we're gonna talk about is um, async processing. Uh, Next, um, so here's here's a programming pattern that um, comes up a lot. Run some function asynchronously, whatever that means. Like take a function, I don't know, go run it in a thread or in the background or so, it's a deferred or something. Go run it in the background and then uh, get the result back later on. It's all sorts of examples of stuff like this, multiprocessing, you know, you get into like twisted and things like that. You, you see this pattern all the time. Um, here's, here's sort of a, the, the super modern way of doing that in Python 3 would be to use the concurrent futures module. So um, I'll, I'll do a little example of that. So let's say you said from, from concurrent uh, futures, uh, I'm going to import a th what's known as a thread pool executor because, well, threads are great and I, you know, I've got to, got to use those. So, um, so, so what you can do is you can say, okay, let's, let's get a thread pool executor. And then you can say, let's, let's make one of those with maybe eight workers. And then what this thing is, is it, 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 it represents kind of a pool of threads running in the background that I can submit jobs to. So here, here's here, what I'm going to do here is sort of a stupid, uh, a stupid little job here. Um, it's, it's not the most interesting thing, but I'm going to have a function that, that essentially sleeps for maybe 10 seconds and then just returns a value. I ha I'm having it sleep just so I can make it delay for a while, okay? So, so what happens, the uh, way that this works, is you can say, okay, pool, I want, I want to submit function to you with arguments 2, 3, and I want you to go, want you to go work on it. So, um, so what's going what's gonna to happen if you do that? is this thing is going to come back and it's going to say, oh, here's a, here's a future. Turns out that that's an object. There's like this future object that comes back. Um, what that future is, is it represents the work of that function executing. Okay, so while I'm sitting here talking, the function is, is running, you know, I'm, I'm at the prompt. Um, that, that, that future result is essentially going to collect the result of what happened. Like if I call underscore result, it'll say, oh, I got... I got five. It, it actually executed in the background while I was, while I was talking. Um, if you do these, if you do these steps, 
like quickly, like if I were to say, hey, go compute the function, now give me the result, um, you'll actually see the thing just block up, saying, yeah, okay, well now I'm churning on it, I'm gonna wait for it to, wait for it to finish. Now I get the, now I get the vibe. So this, this is actually, a, a, some, I'm trying to think when futures got added to Python 3, I think 3.2, they've been around a little while. So um, it's kind of a, maybe a more modern version of the multiprocessing library, perhaps, but you can, you can, Essentially submit a job out, get a result back. Um, another thing that you can do is um, do sort of a callback kind of style with this. You can, s you can actually write something like, uh, like a little callback function where you can say handle the result, um, you know, print got, you know, result dot result, you know, maybe, maybe something like this. And you can say, um, you, could s you can say pool submit, you know, func func23. And then what you can do is essentially um, add a callback function to that, like that. Um, what will happen here is that code will automatically trigger the callback when it finishes. So you see it print print got five there. So so this is uh, this is programming pattern, somewhat common. You know, again, we're just we're submitting stuff to the background, having it having it run. And um, what happens with this this um, concurrent futures thing is that the results are essentially represented by this future object and you can either just wait for a result or you can register a callback function with it that gets triggered on on completion so there's a lot of things like this I mean you know triggering callbacks um, you know callback callback based program um, another extension to this by the way um, if, if there are exceptions that take place I'll just note that they propagate out of the result so if you did one of these um, like if you did this future thing where you say, okay, submit this as a, as a, as a result. Oh, actually, let me not do that. Let, let's say you submitted one that had an obvious like error in it. Like I submitted two plus hello. Um, what's gonna happen there is that if you get an exception, it will actually propagate when you ask for the result. Okay, so the thing basically blew up there saying, oh, you got a, you got a type error. Okay, so n nasty, nasty trace back trace back doing that. So, uh, so, so here's, here's kind of a more uh, maybe full example, error handling with a callback function where you say, okay, I'm gonna submit a function to a pool, add a callback, and then the callback will either get a result or print out exception handling. All right, so let me, let me, just, let me just pause for a second and say, okay, hmm. This is, this is probably a style of programming that many of you have seen, but like callback based programming. It's like, go do something, call me when it comes back. Comes up a lot in different, different contexts. Um, and if you, if you look at that code and kind of, kind of meditate on a little bit, you know, I, w I would claim that it, it probably is something that looks, looks familiar, right? You know, like callback hell, you know, that's, I don't know, I, 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 I need to coin the term like poutine code or something like that, you know, it like seems like a good idea at the time, but then maybe the next day it's, uh, <laughs> You know, something like that. So, th so, so, so there's that. Um, but there, there's something else about this code that is sort of, I don't know, sort of curious. Um, what, if, what if I changed the kind of the names of the functions that I had in that code? Like, there's some entry code that is submitting something to a pool and then adding a callback. And then you have some exit code, which is handling the result. Um, it almost looks like a context manager. It's not really quite the same as a context manager, but it, it's, it's kind of similar though. I mean, it's like you have two pieces of code like that and you can ask this question of, could I do that yield trick with something like that? Um, instead of having two functions, could I have one function and then use the, the, the yield again to chop the thing in half in some way? Kind of the, kind of the idea here is that I'm gonna submit something to a pool and then when it's done, it will come back to me with the result. So you have, instead of two functions, you're gonna have one function kind of, kind of glued together. Um, if, you, if you look at that and say, hmm, well that seems familiar or maybe I've seen something like that before. It's not a new idea. Um, Twisted has done this for a while. Uh, if you know about the Twisted package, they have something known as an inline callback. If you look at the example of that, uh, Oh, yield statement right in the middle there, and then they, they get the result back. Okay, so, so people have been messing around, messing around with that for a while. Um, and so we're actually gonna, we're gonna look at that in some detail about how to 
do that? Like, how would you, uh, how would you do something like that uh, in the context of Python 3? And it, and it turns out that there's some, there's some pretty interesting little features of doing this. So, uh, so as, as a preview of, of what I'm going to do is there's going to be a part of this that's going to wrap a generator function with, quote, a task object. Um, the purpose of that is essentially some code to supervise the execution of a generator. Like it turns out if you have a generator, like if you're, if you're going to do this, this little trick with the yield, you actually have to have some piece of code that actually it like runs that. Like a yield statement by itself doesn't do anything. You actually have to have some piece of code that's going to that's that's manage that. So that's what the, uh, well that's what the task is going to do. And then we actually have to have some code that, that executes it as well. So we're going we're, we're gonna to take this kind of, kind of pull, you know, pull it apart. Um, it will kind of bend your mind a little bit, um, as, as you'll see in a second. But let me, um, let me kind, of, kind of jump into that. Um, I'm going to continue to use threads as, as an example, by the way. Uh, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm saying it because they're easier to work with than everything else. Um, uh, mainly, uh, uh, the reason I'm using threads is I don't want to get um, sort of sucked into this black hole of implementation concerning background processing. Uh, the, the idea is we're going to be submitting something to just some back, to some, we're going to be submitting a job. It takes place in the background. I don't know how it takes place, but I just know it's going to finish at some point. Okay, so that's why I'm using threads. Key, key things here, some background processing. Um, don't worry about it too much right, right now. So. Here's, here's what we're going to do. Um, this, this is kind of the, the basic problem that we're going to address, is how do you start with this generator function, and how are we going to cut it apart? Here's kind of the idea of how this is going to work. Um, everything in this, in this function that appears before the yield is, is going to be thought of as kind of setup code, if you will. It's kind of like, well, that's, that's sort of setting up the task, or, or, or it's sort of running, running to that point. And then what the yield is going to do is produce one of these future objects. It's, going to, it's essentially saying, hey, here's a future. And keep in mind that that future is representing this background task. Okay, so we're saying, hey, run this, run this a background. And then what we're, going to, what we're going to do is a neat little gluing trick where we're going to attach a callback to that that makes the rest of the generator function start up again. So this is the, the idea behind the trick. And here's some, uh, here's some code that, that does that. Um, let me uh, see if I have that. Uh, so I'm mean, gonna do, do a little demo on it. So here, here, here's kind of the, the gist of the idea. Um, I'm gonna have a class that essentially wraps around a generator function. Here's the generator here, self underscore gen. You give me a generator and in this class, I'm actually, I'm actually going to have two methods. Um, the, 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 this is going to look a little weird in the way that it's structured, but I'm going to have um, what's known as a step method, the purpose of which is to get the code to go to the next yield statement. It's kind of like, okay, I want you to run to the next, next yield. Actually, I should probably put a comment in there. It's, it's just saying run to the next yield. So what you're going to do is you're going to hand me a value, and then what I'm going to do is run to the yield by using the send method. So I'm going to say, okay, generator send, here's a value, go to the yield. Once it hits the yield, I'm going to assume that a future got returned. Okay, like I submitted it to a pool or something like that. Future comes back. And then what I'm going to do is just uh, add a callback function saying, hey, when you finish whatever that future is, I want you to go down here to this wake up function and give me the result. So what will happen is this wake up is sort of the, like the handling of, 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 re of results down here. And the interesting thing that's going to happen in, in there is that I'm actually going to do a feedback loop on myself. <laughs> kind of to run to the next yield. So the, the idea is it's going to pick up a result and then it's going to like feed it back into itself. So you have this, this kind of, this, this sort of weird little like task object that's going on here where it's like, you give me a generator, I'm going to like step, step through this thing and, and, and try to, try to drive it. Um, and so, so, so that's kind of the idea. And you can look at that and say, okay, well, how in the, how is that, how is that going to work exactly? Here's how, here, here's, here's a demo 
of how that works. Okay, so I have, keep in mind, I have this function. At least I, I did have a function. Up, oh yeah, this function x, y, time, sleep, 10, return x plus y. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write a little, a little thing called like do func here. You give me x, y, and I'm going to um, essentially say, you know, I actually want to yield a pool submit func x, y. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, I want, I'm going to submit this thing out to this thread pool, and then I'm going to print the result print the result like that. Um, this is a generator function. So if I call this thing, like if I say g is equal to, uh, equal to do func 2, 3, it's going to come back and say, well, there's a generator. The whole purpose of this task is essentially to wrap around that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, make a, make a task out of that thing. And then if I call step on it, this will basically start the thing running. Okay, so, um, so if this thing is working, which I'm 90% sure that it is, uh, um, that thing is running in the background, and then, oh, okay, it just popped up, got, got five. Everybody kind of see, see what happened there? I could do it again. Like, I could say t is equal to task, you know, do func four, five, and then step the thing. Keep in mind, I'm still alive kind of in the interpreter here. Um, like that, um, got nine. Very kind of, kind of unusual, um, un unusual thing going on there. Um, essentially what, what's happening is this little fragment of code, it's, it's submitting work to the background, but it's even sort of weirder than that. It's actually running and almost entirely as like a little background task. It's not a, it, and it's weird because it's like, it's not a thread really. It's, well, that's just weird. It's like you have this, this function with the yield using this future thing, and it's sort of representing some kind of, kind of background processing. Question here, yeah. What would happen if you ran, like, Oh, that's a good question. Actually, we could do, like, um, you could do, like, 4i in range 10. Um, well, we, we, could do th we could just say, like, task of, like, do func, like, ii step or something like that. This is kind of a shortcut. Um, uh, what, what, what's happening there is I'm, I'm basically just launching like 10 of them in the, in the background. And the question is like, what in the world is that going to do? Dramatic pause for the 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, all, okay, a whole bunch of results just, just popped out of it. Um, now the question is what happened to... Uh, Oh, 18, okay, there's two more. Oh, 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 okay, I know what happened. We, we only had a thread, we only had a pool of eight threads. So, um, so eight got to run immediately, and then once two finished, two more got in, and then, it, then they ran. Okay, I was getting a little bit worried, like the missing 18 and the <laughs> 16 there. So, so that, that, that's, that's kind of, it's kind of cool in a, in a, in a way, what's, what's, what's going on there. Um, the slides, in, in a sense, kind of step you through what I just did. Um, you know, again, the, the idea of this task is that you're wrapping around a generator, and the step function is um, it just advancing it like one step, sort of saying, hey, you know, go, go one step forward. Uh, the wake up method is kind of embedded with this callback business. It's like the, the, the callback is triggering wake up, and then what wake up does is it does a feedback in, into, the, into the code. Actually, the purpose of that feedback, by the way, is sort of interesting as well. Um, one of the things that we could, we could do is write a function like example, you know, n, like uh, while n greater than zero, result equals um, pool submit funct like nn. You could actually do something like this. This is, uh, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, okay, hold on a second. Um, I, I, I forgot to put the yield statement in there. That's the, uh, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the yield statement here um, and then print, yeah, I got that. I think that will work. Okay, so so you could have like you could have a function like that where you could say, okay, let's 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 wrap that up in one of these tasks and step it. Uh, what will happen with this code if I've done it right is it will um, essentially output like a new message every ten seconds. 
just kind of sitting there, sitting there in the background. So it says, okay, got 20. It will come back alive in another 10 seconds and print 18. Keep, it, keep in mind it's adding 10 and 10 together to get 20. So you can look at that and say, well, okay, that's really kind of wild because it's almost like a it's almost like a thread or something. It's like some kind of background task just kind of churning away in the in, in the in the background there using yield. So that that's sort of unusual. Um, and so this 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 whole idea, I mean, you can look at that and say, well, that's just that's just sort of wild. You take you take a generator, wrap it with a task, force it to run. And it sort of magically works. Um, and, and you can even do things like loops and, 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 and so forth. Everybody kind of see, uh, see what's going on there? It turns out, there, it turns out uh, that, that there are even crazier things that you can do with this. Um, wh one of the things that's in the slides, by the way, I'm not sure I'm going to talk about it a whole lot, but if you want to have exception handling supported in this, um, you have to modify the code slightly to, to handle that. Essentially, the, the wake-up method needs to handle the possibility of an exception being raised. And then this feedback loop needs to have the ability to either throw or send in a, a like either throw an exception or send in an exception. I'm not sure I want to dwell on exception handling, except know that that's a, like an issue in real code that you would have to, uh, have to deal with that. So, um, so, so you, know, you can look at this and say, well, this is just... It's, it's, it's just kind of bizarre. I mean, it's really bizarre what's, what's going on. Um, I, thought, I thought I would show as another kind of weird example of some, something even, like, even stranger. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a function recursive in uh, that does something sort of weird. Um, what I'm going to do is, is submit, to a, the, submit to the pool just a request to sleep for maybe a millisecond or something like that. Just Just... Just for the, I don't know, no reason at all. Just like go sleep for a while, and then uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a task on myself. And I'm going to step that. This is like this is like so wrong on so many levels, right? It's like it's like, so I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, oh, actually, I should probably put a print. Well, I'll put a, I'll put the print down here. Why not? Okay, so um, I'll put the print after the the, the recursive thing there. Uh, this is this is essentially a, t uh, a function that's submitting itself to go to sleep, and then it submits itself back to the like the task system, and then it prints something out. Um, this this thing is is sort of bizarre. Um, it, so if if I said recursive like one. It'll come back and say, that's a generator object. If I wrap it with a task and then step it, um, it will actually uh, run forever outside the bounds of the Python recursion limit. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, you know, you know, hopefully you know that Python has a recursion depth limit of like 1,000, right? Okay, so this thing's already submitted itself, you know, like 12,000 times. It's well out of the recursion limit. Uh, on, on top of that, I, I, I don't even, I don't think it's, doing much with memory either like um, you know it, it's probably it's probably blowing kind of ipython's output a little bit but it's it's not like it's not like exploding memory or anything as it runs runs either so um, so that that's a little bit weird and since it's a background task i can't kill it at this point other than to uh, <laughs> other than to uh, kill the uh, python interpreter so um, get get rid of that okay so um, so that, that that's that's kind of wild. I mean, this is like, okay, I got, I have tasks, like, like this weird recursive thing, and like, the, the, the rules don't, uh, don't seem to, uh, seem to apply, and it, and it actually kind of takes us into the, uh, this next part. Um, I, I, I saw this photo on, on Twitter at some point, the, uh, the, the keep out unquantifiable hazards, uh, hazard sign. Um, this this is sort of the feeling that I get from that last example, where it's it, it's it's like hmm, I'm submitting a generator into this thread pool, and like crazy stuff is going on in the background. Like what what is what is happening with that? Um, here is here is a a line of a line of thought that I want to want to think about with that code. Um, if if you look at that code, like if I were to um, you know pull up that 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 inline code again. And look at this this task code. In some sense, this code is sort of a 
it's sort of a one-trick pony in a way. Um, and, and, and the reason that I say that is that the, this, this thing, it wraps around a generator. Yes, yeah, so you'd give it a generator function, but it turns out that that generator function can only do one thing, which is emit a future object. Like, it, it sort of assumes that a future comes back, and if not, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So it, in some sense, it's, um, it's, this, it's just this one trick thing, where it's just like, it only works if a, if a future comes back. So you run the generator, you attach a callback function. That's the only thing that's going on with that. And the reason that you might care about that is you might start thinking about things like, well, could I write library functions with this whole, with this whole weird little trick that I'm doing, right? So could I, you know, he, like here, here's what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about with library functions. So let's, let's say you had, um, get, out of, get out of that. So let's say you had a, uh, you had your, your function again, like um, I, have to, I have to recreate it because of the uh, quitting IPython there. But um, let, let's say you had your function, you know, I'm going to sleep for a second, return, return x and y. And then let's say I had, you know, the, the do funct thing that I had before where it's, okay, x and y, I'm going to do a yield, you know, pool submit funct x, y. And then, I don't know, got got result. Okay, so this, this is kind of the, the code from before was that. And then, again, we had to have a thread pool. Okay, so we have to, we have to recreate that. Um, here, here's, the, here's the sort of thing that I'm thinking about with library functions is, could you, could you write something like this where you'd say, okay, I'm gonna write a function after, or you give me a delay along with a generator function and then maybe I do something like this, right? Say, okay, submit to the pool, maybe a request to sleep for like some amount of time. And then could I yield the, could I yield the generator? Kind of the idea here is, is, is now run the, uh, run the task. You know, could, could, could do something like that. So, so, the, the, so instead of doing something like this, right? I'd say task do func two, three step, where it just runs in one second. I could say something like, task after, you know, after 10 seconds, now do funct two, three, already losing track of parentheses here, and could I do that? Like, would that kind of thing work? Um, so the idea is here is it's now it's sleeping for 10 seconds, and when it's done, um, will, it, will it work? Turns out that that doesn't really work, and the, the, the reason it doesn't work is it turns out that this little bit of code here is sort of busted in a way. The reason that it's busted is that this, um, that this whole task thing only works if a future comes back. It doesn't actually work here because um, that thing that is being produced is not actually a future. It's actually another generator of some kind. It's, some, it's something else that's, that's, that's going on there. So you could, you could, you could sort of fiddle around with that and think, well, okay, well, could I get that to work somewhere? Like, is, is there something that I could do um, to, you know, to sort of make that, you know, make that work in some way? Um, you know, and, 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 and you know, here's, here's kind of the line of thinking is, you know, maybe th this, this will see if I can, uh, nah, my, my IPython skills. What, what, what is the, the, uh, the, to edit a previous command in IPython, is it, um, Is it percent seven? Well, I, anyway, I'll, let me just do it. Any, I'll do it manually here. So, um, so what what you could do is, um, is 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 say, well, okay, I'm going to try something else with this after function. What I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, yield pool, um, submit, you know, time sleep, delay, and then maybe what I could do is just run the generator. This, this is one idea. So I could just say, well, okay, for future in gen, yield future. This is the kind of, th this is this, the thing which like, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to run it myself. So I'm going to try that now, you know, try this, this version of it. So the idea here is that this thing is going to sleep for 10 seconds, and then when it's done, I'm going to run the, the, the generator that was provided and see whether I can get it to, get it to work. Okay, so they, like, the code... It actually ran, 
but it didn't it didn't work because it lost the result. Do you, do you kind of see that? I mean, it's like it ran defunct, but the uh, the five essentially disappeared into the vapor somewhere. So we don't know what happened to the result. It just got it got none. So that sort of um, that sort of thing doesn't work either. Like if you try to manually run the uh, you know run run the task, that that doesn't work. Um, it turns out that another way to do this. Um, is to do this little bit of code. Um, let me see if I can type that in real quick. Um, this, this is sort of the more insane version, is you can, you can say, um, okay, let's, let's submit the thing to sleep. And then what I'm gonna do is capture the result. I'm gonna put myself into a while loop and um, essentially do something like this, where they, I'm gonna say result is equal to gen dot, well actually, I'm going to say future is equal to gen dot send in result, and then um, I'm already blowing my mind here. Uh, they, they, like yield, uh, yield the yield the future there, uh, and then um, what in the world am I doing here? Um, well, I'm already blowing my mind here. Okay. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, I have to go back. I, I see, I told you that I was worried about blowing my mind in this tutorial. Um, oh, no, okay, yield. So what was, uh, I'll just stick to this slide here. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I was telling John earlier that I had to leave my office on numerous occasions, like preparing this tutorial because it made my, my head explode so many times. Okay, so, 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 so what's happening here is you're sending in the result and then capturing the result and then kind of running a while loop. Uh, if, if you do that, it will actually work. But there's no way that you'll be able to explain this to anybody what you're doing. Like, I wasn't even able to do it. So you can imagine, like, code review, right? It's like, hey, I, I got this little trick with generators. And then, then like, you're looking for a job afterwards, right? You know, nobody <laughs> understands it. So, so it turns out that that sort of stuff, that is what the yield from statement is about. Um, and this is the, the really... Um, amazing thing about that yield from that, I'll, I'll be honest, I did not fully appreciate when I saw that added to Python. Um, it turns out that, that, the, that the yield from is, the, is sort of the ultimate punt for doing anything related to generators. Like what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, go to sleep, and then I'm just gonna say yield from generator, like that. What is so awesome about that is you are like washing your hands of all responsibility for what you just did there. No, seriously, it's like, <laughs> like, like you're basically just saying, you know what, that is not my problem. Whatever that generator is, it is not my problem. Um, and, it, and it turns out that, that if you do that and you run this thing, um, it will just magically work. It will, like, it will take care of everything, the send and all the exception handling and everything. Yeah, question here. Yeah, the question is, it, it, well, when I said yield from, it's kind of like getting Python to iterate over a generator for you. Um, that is what it's doing, but it's doing way more than that. It's actually doing everything associated with the generator that is, that is legal, like throwing exceptions, sending things, the whole, the whole thing, yeah. It didn't work, yeah, that was the, that was the thing that I had earlier. I, try, I tried to do this. Yeah, I, I actually tried to do that. And the reason that that didn't work is that uh, for this inline future thing, there's way more going on. Like it's sending values. And like I, have to, I basically have to account for that. Um, and the thing that's, that's, that's awesome about this yield from is it is. It's, 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 like, it's like you're washing your hands of all responsibility. Like it's, it's like that's just some generator, not my problem. Yield for, like the yield from is the, the ultimate, like not my problem. Like you just stick a yield from in front of it. And it will, it will just run happily away, um, you know, whatever is going to happen there. Um, so, so that 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 is actually amazing. I mean, I think that's that's amazing. Um, and, and and the thing that's also that that's awesome about that is that, you know, I I, I will admit having before the, doing this tutorial, I didn't really fully appreciate that in PEP 380. I mean, I knew that this PEP 380 was out there about oh yeah, we added the yield from and there's. 
there's some cute examples where like, oh, you don't have to do the for loop anymore. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. And, and, and so forth. Then they started digging into this and it was, it was like, whoa, there's like way more to PEP 380 than just getting rid of the for loop. I mean, that's, that's really cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's way more powerful than, than people might think. Um, and opens up some, open up, opens up some possibilities. Um, but, it, but it does lead to like a different sort of weird uh, problem that's a little bit subtle. Um, what do people think of this, this, this after function? Like if I were showing you this code and it's like, hmm, yield pool, yield from. Maintain that, okay? Like go into code and like try to maintain something like that. I think trying to maintain something like that would be incredibly confusing to people because it's gonna immediately gonna open up a line of questioning is when do I use the yield and when do I use the yield from? It's kind of like this, like with objects, like if you have a whole bunch of methods that take no parameters, like do you add the parentheses to it or is it an attribute? Like you get into this thing like, oh, when do, when do you add parentheses and when do you not? Sort of the same thing. It's like, well, when do I use the yield from? When do I use the yield? I would claim that, that would be incredibly confusing in code. Um, we already did an example sort of showing that you, like you can't just say yield gen. Like you can't just get rid of the yield from. I mean, there's, there's, there's importance to that. Um, you might try doing something like this, like this thought, well, can you just use the yield from whenever you want to? Like, can you just do that? Like, like could I go into this code and just say, you know, okay, yield from is so awesome. I'm just gonna universally use it everywhere. You know, is there a difference between the two? Um, okay, so you can say yield, like, does that work? It turns out that that does not work because you're trying to use yield from on a future object and then the future object just comes back and says, I don't know, what are you doing? I'm not, I don't know how to iterate. So that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, okay, hates that. Um, but then, you could, then you, you could ask this question, well, could I make it work? <laughs> I mean, you know, could we, uh, could we put the square peg into the round hole if we hit it hard enough or something? Uh, uh, so, something like that, um, and it turns out you can. Um, <laughs> let me show you how you how you would do that. Okay, so um, this 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 will really this will really blow your mind. Here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna import the um, the concurrent futures future object. So this is this is an existing object. It turns out that if you want to make that work, you just have to address this error message. It's not iterable. Well, let's make it iterable. Okay, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna make, uh, I'm gonna make a, an iterator method, and this is this is gonna be one of the most crazy things that you will ever see. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check myself to see whether I'm done or not. This is an, an, a, a feature of, of futures where you can say, oh, if I'm if I'm if I'm not done, I'm actually just going to yield myself. Keep in mind that the whole point of this, of, this, of this future stuff is you have to yield futures. So if I yield myself, that's a future. Problem solved, right? It's like, okay, so, um, and, then, uh, and then what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm just, if, 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 if I am done, I'm just gonna return my result back. Something like that. I better check my notes to make sure that I'm doing this right. Okay, well, we'll, we'll try it out. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Uh, and then what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drop that onto, onto future and just say, okay, you're, you're iterable now. Okay, let, let, let's, 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 actually, let's actually try that and see. Okay, didn't crash. Big pause after 10 seconds here. And it actually ran. That is, I, I, I'll be honest, that is probably the most insane hack that I have seen in like the last five years of Python. Like, okay, you take a future, you drop an iterator on it that yields itself. I mean, where did that come from? This is not my idea, by the way. I'll talk about where this comes from in a second. But like, you yield yourself and then return yourself result. I mean, what in, like, what? universe of code did that come from uh, so so you you can you can do this thing where you just like you just patch 
the future object with making it iterable. And somehow, magically, it makes the yield from work. Now, here, here's, here's what is underlying this whole little trick. Um, it turns out that, that, that what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a system of code where future is the only thing that uses the yield. Turns out that that, that yield is going to be the only one in the whole system. That. Future can yield. Nobody else is going to yield. It turns out that everything else in the whole code is going to use yield from. And if you do that, you're going to end up with these, these sort of chains of, uh, of generator calls where um, if I run the code and call next, it will basically fall through this whole chain of yield from. So it'll be like yield from, yield from, yield from. Follow the chain, follow the chain. And then it will hit future. And then it's like, bam, there's the yield, which happens to produce itself. And then it like will like propagate back up. A really sort of uh, sort of wild uh, technique that's that's going on there, which is it's like wow, okay, that's that that's sort of that's sort of insane. Uh, uh, because of of the nature of that, I would claim that it's probably a, a, a somewhat reasonable idea to demark your code or to, to note, do something in your your code to note that this is what you're doing. So. Um, what I have here is essentially a decorator where you give me a function, it asserts that it's actually a generator function and it just returns itself. Uh, the point of this is purely syntax. You drop it on the front of a function saying, hey, this is an inline future, and then you use yield from. The only point of doing that at basically is to alert everybody else that you're doing something insane in there. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's just saying, look, this is that. Um, it, it's a little bit of notation. Um, so, so you're going to do that. Um, and then there's one other thing that you might want to do on top of this. And this, this, will, this will really take it to the next level. Um, it turns out that these task objects that you, that you created to run are a little bit weird. Um, you know, in, in the example, you might look at those tasks and say, well, they're kind of like thread, a little bit kind of look like threads. I mean, it's like you have this function and it's kind of running in the background. The thing that's a little bit weird about it, though, is that if you, if you make one of these tasks, like say t is a task, I can't do anything useful with this, this, like this task object. I can't say, like, I can't join with it. There's no way to get a, like a result out of it. It's kind of like, it, it's like you just punted this thing to the background and now it's like outside of your control or there's, it's kind of living in its own little universe. That is a little, that's a little weird. Or it's a little bit undesirable because you can't, you can't really do much with it. Um, and it turns out that there's a little tweak that you can do with it to make it significantly more interesting. Um, and the tweak is to make it inherit from future. And you're like, Oh, good God. Okay, so, um, so wh what's going to happen here? And, and also what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the stop iteration exception set the result of myself because I'm a, I'm a future. So I'm going to set the result on myself here. Um, this, is, this is what will happen here is just completely kind of amazing, actually. Um, what, will, what will happen now is if you create one of these tasks, it itself is one of these future objects, which means that you can actually use things like result to like wait for it. Like you can actually wait for the result to come back and do all sorts of things. So you, so you actually have this situation where it's like you have a task, runs a generator, it produces futures. The task itself is a future. So then you can like start mixing it up with all this other stuff. This is another time to kind of like leave the office, right? You know, it's like my head is throbbing so bad. I got to take a walk around the block and get a, get a coffee or something. So, um, so, so kind of what, what's, happening with, what's happening with this is some really, you know, head exploding stuff. I mean, what, what, what I'm having here is I might have some function that's submitting something to a pool. A result is coming back. What will happen is the result will end up getting propagated through like a stop iteration exception, which then takes the value and like sets it on this future object and then it propagates down here. There, there will be a quiz and a debugging session a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit later on this, but, um, 
So, so you have that. Um, some other things that you, that you might do to kind of clean this up is maybe write a few little utility functions to kind of hide details. Like you can have, you could maybe do something like, uh, like, like start inline future that automatically creates the task and, and causes stepping on it. You could also have like a little, like little utility to just run it, wait for a result. I think I have some code for that. Let me just... Uh, Okay, so, so here, here's kind of a more like a fully featured uh, version of, the, of all these things, all these things that I have. So let me, um, actually, let me just, let me just run that to uh, uh, just, 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 just kind of show how that works. So, um, okay, it's waiting for a result here real quick. So, so, so kind of the idea here is you could have like a, you could, you could say like do funct, you know, x, y, um, you know, yield oh, result equals uh, something like that. I'll, I'll put in like the, uh, okay, so you, you could do something like that. And I, I essentially have a couple of utility functions. Like I could say start inline future do font two, three. Oh, duh, okay. I don't need, need to do that. So, so I have something where you can just launch like a task. That, that's basically launching like a background task. Or I, or, I, or I could say something like result is equal to run inline future do funct two three. That just sort of waits for it and then passes the result back. Okay, so, so, so kind of building up a, a little, little bit of machinery here. Um, kind of the purpose of these functions is the, um, the run in line just runs it to, the, to finish. And then the other one lets you do stuff in parallel. Like you can launch multiple tasks. We kind of did an example of that um, a, a little bit earlier. So, so you can look at this code and you can say, well, okay, maybe Dave is just insane. I mean, what, is, what the hell is this? Uh, what, what is going on here? Um, if you step back from this code, and you look really carefully at it, what you've built is kind of a, like a generator sort of based task system. It's, it's, it's underlying, the, uh, under the covers, it's using threads and pools and so forth. But, but over here, I'm just writing sort of generator functions and little coroutines and yield and so forth. Um, and, the, and the whole thing is kind of tied together with these future objects. Okay, so you have these future objects, and you have generators, and so forth. Um, why would I be going in this? Why would I be going in this direction? Uh, it turns out that almost everything that we've done here is the basis of async I/O, which is the new thing added in 3.4. It's the outcome of the Tulip project that, that Guido talked about last year. Um, turns out that if you go into async I/O, you have tasks, coroutines, things like run until complete, futures, event loop. But essentially, what's happening in async I/O is instead of threads and thread pools, uh, you replace that with event loops, asynchronous processing. But a lot of the other stuff is actually um, very, very similar. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, this is, um, this is an example of, a, of an async I.O. hello world program. Um, import async I.O. Here's a function. It's kind of similar to the one that I just did. You know, add, add two numbers. And then what you can define are things like these async I.O. coroutines, where you can say, hey, this is a, this is a coroutine. Hey, I want to sleep for a while. Yield from async I.O. sleep. Hmm, okay, that looks very similar to what we just did using the yield from. Um, and you, know, you, you, can actually, you can actually experiment with these things a little bit. Like if you said import async IO, and then I said S is equal to async IO sleep, like that. And you say, well, what is that? Oh, it's a, hmm, interesting, generator function. Like, hmm, okay. If I were to call next on it, well, that's interesting. A future pops out of that. It's exactly the same thing that's, that's going on. Like the thing that we just did is what's going on in async IO. It's futures, it's generators, it's tasks. Um, I mean, all the, uh, kind of all the way down. In fact, if you, um, I think like you can even, like, let me see if I can edit. Um, like async IO even has the, the, the notion of like a task object. Coroutine wrapped in a future. It even inherits from future. It's exactly the same thing that I just did with it, that inheritance trick. Um, and you'll see, I mean, there's, there's a little bit more stuff that they've built into it. 
you know, to make it to make it work. But um, yeah, like some debugging debugging stuff. But here's here's like the step function. This is kind of the same thing that I did in our code, the stepping thing. Um, you have a uh, I think there's a wake up function. A lot of this is more complicated because they're interacting with an event loop. Partly that's why the reason that I didn't want to do it is to, to simplify the code. But uh, so much of what they're doing is, is, is exactly the same thing that we did. Um, let me see if, I was, uh, if the future class is in here. I don't know whether that's in there or not. Um, but that's, that, that, that's, that's what's going on. Async I.O. Here, here's kind of another example of async I.O. Um, like some server, like client server code. Um, you're declaring like an echo client. Reader writer object using yield from. Again, yield from. It's like yield from reader read line. What does that do? Well, it's essentially interacting with this async I.O. library saying, hey, I want you to, I want to read a line of data, but don't, don't give it to me until you've got it. It's suspending. So, and then, and then you see things like, like also the, like these things here, like loop run until complete. That's kind of like this like run inline future thing that we did, kind of, kind of runs it in the background. So very, very interesting stuff going on in that async IO library. Um, one, of the th one of the things that you'll find is if you go into the documentation for async IO, uh, you're gonna see a lot of things in the documentation where they explicitly say, like, this is a coroutine. This is a coroutine. This is a coroutine. They actually like list all this stuff out, saying these are coroutines. If you ever see that, it's meant to be called with like a yield from. It's all tied up in this like inline future yield from business that that we just did here. So, uh, so that is just. I mean, I think it's just utterly kind of mind blowing. I mean, a actually, if you really, uh, I mean, if you really want to just expand like. I don't know, expand your brain on some really cutting edge stuff. Go look at the source code for async IO. I mean, these things like wrapping futures with iterators and all that stuff, that, that is actually where all that is coming from. Um, just to be clear, I did not invent that. I mean, it's, it's, it's more like it discovered it and it shattered like half my brain cells trying to, uh, trying to figure it out. So, uh, so that's where it's coming from. Uh, and it's probably a good idea to just put this random photograph in the tutorial. I don't know. This is something in the news from a few weeks ago. You know, snake eats crocodile after a, a, after some battle. That, that's kind of how I feel about that that kind of inline future stuff. It's 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 like wow, that's some some crazy uh, uh, crazy stuff going on in there. So um, so with that. I'm under the impression we're actually at the break. Is that the, it, I'm showing 10, my alarm just went off, so I'm showing 10, 15. So I think there's a break. Um, when we come back, we're gonna look at some other crazy stuff. So it gets more crazy from here in a, in a sense. So how, how long do we have on the break? Um, do you know, is it a, is it 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Okay, well, whenever we're supposed to come back from the break, come back, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's awesome. This is really great. And, uh, um, David, Brian, hey, nice to be here. I'm stealing 10 minutes of your talk, man, because uh, <laughs> I'm doing a talk on async I.O. for uh -huh. And I did like the alpha alpha at CoPy about two weeks ago. And the thing that everybody got lost on was yield from and how it worked and what it was about. So I'm going to like yank five minutes out of here and stick it right at the beginning of my talk and say, OK, now you understand that part. <laughs> there's some the there's some stuff. seriously crazy stuff going yes. on with that yield from. I mean, because you know I just sort of yada yada use this and everybody was like, what does it do? How does it work? I wish I had a job where I could use that in my day to day. Interestingly I, I enough, I have some twisted code that reads, twisted code. reads uh, messages from a medical a healthcare uh, system, but I'm just waiting through all this stuff to get. 
Give it, give it to, give it to her. Well, give that, give it that <coughs> beer for like three, four. And they say, wait, I'm going to grab a, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna grab a water here real quick. And it's only one piece. It's just uh, it's all it is is basically an over-glorified line receiver that's sitting right there. Sure. Next line is from some funky old yeah. metal equipment and stuff. Yeah. Which apparently is how they do everything. Yeah, how long do we have for a break? Uh, I, don't know. I don't know either. Do you know how long we have for a break? Yeah, at least 15 minutes. So. Okay, so, so you have to monkey patch future to make your task work. Yeah, you don't async because it's already they already it's already iterable. It's a different future. Yeah, no. Yeah, there's two different kinds of futures. There's the there's the thread future and there's the async, the async I/O future. So, they're they're hiding like a lot of the uh, the a lot, lot of the mechanics yeah. under there. Yeah. And Hey, how are you doing? I need to. Uh, a little hard. Uh, I think it's a little hard for any hour. I mean, it's. Jump <coughs> in front of you. I gotta sit down for a second. I'm not sure. I mean, I've done the two. I did the. Cookbook. There was some. From statement. Just a vague thing. It's like, oh, I. Async. There's probably like at least two or three yaks. I don't know. I don't really have a lot of.
How does that? How is it working? Do you like it? I mean. I mean, I actually, it's a legitimate question for me because I'm working with some guys in a startup and we're doing a whole bunch of task queuing stuff. I ended up kind of rolling my own system on top of Redis, partly because it just, I don't know, we had like some special requirement. I mean, it's salary. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that there's anything wrong with it or or what but it's you know i had some other things that i wanted to do and then we kind of ended up just sort of rolling our own task queue but i always i sort of wonder it's like well eh, i don't know is that just is that just date being like curmudgeonly or you know not a thing or should i be here or i don't know You would like to what? Take a picture with you. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Maybe let's do it when I'm not wearing the uh, the headset, though. Unless you want me wearing the... Yeah, get me after the talk. No problem. So, so I, was, I was curious. When, when these peps were, were being written, um, were they written with the intention to do what you're doing? <laughs> what the... Uh, like the yield from? Or, I mean, was it written kind of intentionally with this type of purpose? I don't know. I know that the, the, the that this whole business of using coroutines for kind of, of concurrency idea has been floating around for probably five to ten years. Mm. Uh, the yield from one of the one of the problems with the the older work is it was really hard to write libraries, mm. like of of generator functions because you couldn't you couldn't delegate across like library calls, okay. and so you had to do all sorts of flips and twists to kind of get that to work. And the yield from, in some sense, has opened that up. Oh. Like, so you, with yield from, it's just, this, it's just this thing. Like, literally washing your hands of it. Just saying, well, whatever that is, somebody else is dealing with it. And it turns out that that just opens up the whole universe for, like, writing library functions. Okay. So it was written with the kind of explicit Yeah. Term. I mean, I know that async I.O., you know, only, I mean, because of the yield, fr I mean, it requires a yield from. Edo you know, hates callback functions, yeah. which is part of the motivation for it. It's like, well, I don't have to do callbacks because we're going to do everything with coroutines. Yeah, and so even like the deferred model. Yeah. So you got all these ideas from like digging into the async IO source code. And all, all that stuff with like iterable futures mm -hmm. and. Com it like comes from comes from there. Uh -huh. I never would have come up with that hack on my own. I mean, I mean, I, I looked at it. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, you come across an. It, I mean, you, I came across like this iter method. It's like it's it's producing itself, and then returning a result. Like oh, you saw that actually, or you? you yeah, I saw it in the code. Like in, I, I saw it. No, I saw it. I saw it in async IO. And just—I mean—that's where it came from. In it's in the source code for async IO. And and you know uh, you see that it's like, what does that mean? Like I mean, it was yeah. a piece of code that was so insane that it's like, who came up with that? Um, <laughs> like, where did that? What universe did that come out of? Because that's. Do you know who came up with it? I, I don't know. But I have an idea. I, I tweeted it at some point. I just tweeted that code fragment, yeah. and I said, there's some magic here. And then I think Nick Coglin or somebody responded saying, oh, that looks like something out of future. Huh. You, you know, that's <laughs> your, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know who, who came up with that idea. But So when, when you were going through and you were, you were discovering this stuff, what was your kind of mental process like? What was the process of, like, step one to step two to step three? questions you'd ask yourself, the directions that you went in, all steps that you took. 
I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I, I, my, the original thought was to do something with thread tools and generators. Because, you know, so many people have used generators for, for like, I.O. I was thinking, oh, I should do something cool with threads or, or something like that. But then I was trying to reconcile what I was doing with threads with the async library and realized that they were taking sort of a whole different <coughs> approach with it. And then just trying to really just understand what they were doing. I can't say there was like a direct path. It was a lot of, it was a lot of meandering around and yeah. fiddling and trying to like ra trying to ra trying to wrap my brain around like what they're really twisted. what <laughs> that? I said, if that was a direct path. You really twisted. You'd have to be wandering all over the place. I mean, even even these things like, like having tasks inherit from future. It's even understanding why you would do. Or what the imp what the implications of it is. I did a dry run last week okay. for for six B for six B. I should have read your bio, but where do you work or what do you do? Uh, some self employed. Okay. I've written two Python books. So I've written the Python okay. cookbook and the Python Essential okay. Reference. And I just do a lot of training, so I just have to sit for a minute to. So and this is this is beyond the cookbook, by the way. I mean, like if I'd known about this when I was writing the cookbook, it'd be in there. But this is. This Are you gonna make another one with it? Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Well, with the cookbook, though, it's kind of a good help to this. Like uh huh. Like yeah. So it, what's the? Can you use this in kind of, kind of practical sense? Have I used it? Yeah. No. Have you seen anybody use it or take it? I think it's super. I think it's super bleeding edge right now. Uh -huh. But text it's and generators? Have you seen it? Like, like for use of memory? People have been using like generators to do co mm -hmm. concurrency things for a while with some of these things like eventlet, gevent, mm -hmm. like tasklet, green threads, that kind of stuff. But they haven't fully taken it all the way into the level of like this. You know, like what's going on in async I/O. Mm -hmm. And the minimum version that this will work on is three three. Three three. Mm -hmm. So does three four bring anything into it? Not a well. A three four brings async I/O into it. Okay. This is living up to a uh, mind-blowing expectation. Uh, yeah. I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not following everything. I, I suspect if I was, I would have my mind completely blown. I'm going to have to go back over the slides and type more of the code myself. And what was the presentation about? Generators from hell. <laughs> <laughs> I th I he, he called it generators of my old frontier. And you think it's generators from hell? Well, is I mean, just, I, the reason I signed up is because you've been bragging about how, how insane it would be on Twitter. So I finally signed up two days ago. And it should be called generators from hell. <laughs> if you do it again. Oh. <laughs> it's all perfectly reasonable, right? Is, are the materials from the two previous? I mean, the slides are online. Is that it? Yeah, every, yeah everything's up. Okay. All the code and everything's up from there. Yeah.
I'm not actually sure how long this break is, but we'll... Uh, I'll, I'll give people two minutes to show up, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start again here. Yeah, work, work from there, so... Is anybody sufficiently disturbed by the first half? Are they, uh, <laughs> what were they I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll admit in the uh, in the fr we were, I was talking with some people on there in the break. They're kind of asking, "How did like?" They're sort of asking, "How did you get the idea to go in this direction or look at that stuff?" And that's, um, I, I you know, admittedly, I, I think how that happened is I was looking at some other stuff with generators, and then I knew that async IO had come out. I was like, oh, I should go take a look at that, and yeah, just see what's going on there. And then started digging into it and realized that my knowledge of generators was woefully not lacking in some way because there was some sort of level of magic in there that was like I basically just could not understand how that library was working. You know, and then started looking at some of the source code for that. You see things like future objects turned into iterators and, 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 and things that you're just like, good God, like where did this come, like what universe of programming did this come out of? Because it's some completely, f it just looked completely foreign to me. And so, so a lot of that, that previous section is, is in some sense, you know, an attempt on my part to wrap my brain around what in the world is going on in that library. So... I'm not even convinced that it's fully wrapped around it at this point, even, even though I'm like presenting the, uh, you know, the, the material that sort of, uh, and I don't know, keep, keeps me awake, you know, thinking about what's going on there. So, uh, so, so as, uh, as uh, before we go any further, let me just see if there's lingering or open questions about anything. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go in a slightly different direction in a, in a second here. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the thing we're going to do next Favorite topic, global interpreter lock, um, Gil. Uh, I, I don't know whether anybody has kids and is into the bubble guppies or not, but that's, uh, that character's name is actually Gil. Like, who knew? Okay, so um, Python thread, you know, threads. Okay, so hot, hot button topic, you know, it's like every version of Python comes out and people are like, oh, you got rid of the global interpreter lock yet. It's like, no, ah, it sucks. <laughs> so, um, threads, okay, so, you know, uh, you know, talk to people, it's like, what are they good for? Nothing. Um, and uh, it, here's the thing, it's like, actually, threads in Python are awesome at doing nothing. <laughs> like, if you, uh, if you want to sleep or wait for I.O. or something like that, threads were, threads were great for that. Threads can wait as fast as anything out there, you know. Okay, so uh, so threads are threads are great great at nothing. Um, they're bad if you actually want to do something, right? I mean, that's that's basically the whole issue with the global interpreter lock is that if you do work, um, you're limited to one CPU, and then on top of that, the the CPU threads like fight each other and stuff. So I, I so I gave a PyCon talk about that. People drag it out every single time Python gill discussion comes up. So, uh, so, so this is a, there's that issue, issue with the gill. Um, but here, here's kind of the, the thing that seems to be going on. And I, 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 I we'll see how contentious I make this. Um, it seems like that, that the, the, the solution for the Python thread problem seems to be to reinvent the one feature of threads that actually works, which is waiting around. Like if you look at like all these things with event loops and async and coroutines and all that stuff, what are they doing? They're re-implementing I/O. Threads are great at I/O. I mean, so they're they're not actually tackling the problem that threads have, which is CPU. Um, so they're they're reinventing reinventing that. Um, I do have in a little note down at the bottom that you can barely read that yes, there are other issues with threads that coroutines and stuff address. Like if I'm going to open up 100,000 socket connections on my service or server or something. Yeah, okay, I'm not going to have 100,000 thread. Okay, I'll, I'll grant that, but kind, of, but kind of work with me on this line of thought here. Okay, so, uh, so you have all these, these solutions um, that are um, reinventing I.O. Um, but here, here's, here's sort of a, oh, here's, here's the other thing with these event loop things. Um, if you're doing things with coroutines or event loops or 
anything like that. They also have their own issue with CPU bound work and blocking. This is a this is picture of, picture of Chicago from 2011, I think. Like that. It's Lakeshore Drive, basically a uh, basically a bus spun out, blocked all traffic, and then a blizzard came in and like entombed everybody out there for like 14 hours. So, um, so you know, it's a good it's a good analogy for uh, some of the things that can happen in these event driven systems. Basically, you do like a like if you were to initiate some huge computation, it blocks the event loop, and then like everybody's everybody's stuck. Very standard solution to that is to um, delegate work out either to threads or processes. Okay, so like if you have a bunch of work um, and you're concerned about that, you okay, punt it out to a, 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 a like a process pool or something. They have multiple Python interpreters running. Um, there's all sorts of libraries for doing this. Multiprocessing, you use concurrent futures, you can you can do things 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 like that. Uh, and the um, here's here's the the thought experiment. Um, didn't we didn't we just do this? Like in the last like didn't, isn't this kind of what I was doing in the last uh, the last section? I mean we were we were fooling around with this inline future thing with with threads and so forth. Um, you know, I mean, like, you know, where we had this, uh, trying to think, you know, we had this, this task, you know, do func two, three step. Let's make sure it's still, still work. Okay, so do that. Um, would that work if I just went, like, and in, in used a process pool instead? Like, if I said from concurrent futures, import, like, pro I think it's, like, is it process executor? Maybe process pool executor. You can never have, you can never have too long of a name on that. Okay, so um, you know, could you could you just come in and say like, oh, you know, it's a, actually it's a process pool executor with like four workers. Could I actually just do that? Would the code actually still work doing that? And it does still work. It actually turns out that the thing that we just did um, even works with with like with process pools. And so um, one of the, one of the things that you could that you could think about is you know maybe you could do a little like a little experiment involving um, like, a, like a performance test of some kind. Um, seem to have in the, might be in the wrong directory here. So let me, uh, final generator here. Okay, so, uh, so let, let, let's, say, let's say I'm gonna have, let's say you had something like this. Um, what, I'm, what I'm gonna do here is a little performance test where I have a, a horrible method of computing Fibonacci numbers, because why not? Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so horrible recursive recursive method, uh, and then I have a function that just computes like the first n Fibonacci numbers, doing that. And I'm I'm going to use my little my yield, little yield pool thing here. Okay, I'm going to submit it to a pool, re re return the result, and then and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create a process pool, and I'm going to try some of the stuff that we just did in the last section. So I'm actually doing all this inline future stuff that we did. So, I'm at what, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing a little test where I'm going to run this computationally intensive task twice in a row, and I'm going to time how long it took. Okay, so how long did it take to do that? Uh, and then what, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same test where I launch the, um, I launch the tasks in parallel. Okay, so let me put, put a comment here, launch launch in parallel, and then wait for the results to come back. And I'm going to just see what happens. Uh, if you know anything about uh, like thread programming, because of the global interpreter lock, you're not going to get a speed up. I mean, it's, it's essentially the threads, you're kind of you're stuck. But what I'm doing is this, this inline future thing where I'm going to run that like sequentially, and then I'm going to run it in pools. Okay, so let's, let's just run it, see what, see what happens with this. Okay, so, so this thing, this thing's gonna, it's running sequentially right now. Okay, six seconds, 3.9 seconds. So it actually, the, the, the parallel one actually got a, got, a, got a speed up. I mean, it actually ran twice as fast. Um, I don't know whether this is, making a huge amount of sense, but I find this sort of deeply interesting in a way that with these inline futures, I can launch them in parallel, collect their results, and then if I'm using like a process pool, I get like speed up. In some way, this is, this is weird. It's like it's, it's almost operating outside the 
bounds of the global interpreter lock in some way. I mean, it's like you have this, you have this, this task here that looks a lot like a thread. I mean, it's, it's like some kind of thread. It's doing some kind of computation, but yet somehow it's operating outside the bounds of the, outside the, bounds of the gill. Does everybody kind of, kind of see that? Uh, the, thing, the thing that's kind of, that's making that work, by the way, is that this approach is, is essentially punting um, the computation part of it out and having that run in a separate process. It, in some sense, it's actually exploiting this idea that the, that the one thing that threads are bad at is CPU work. So why not just punt on that and punt it out to a pool? That's, that's kind, of the, kind of the idea. So, so you can look at that and say, well, that's kind of, it's kind of odd. It's kind of, kind of interesting what's, what's going on there. Um, just again, everybody kind of see what's, what's going on? I mean, if, if not, that's okay, but it's, it, we're, we're basically playing with the process pool, somehow escaping the gill. Um, okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, the thing that's, that's a little bit also interesting about it is that the way that this whole thing operates is really, really odd behind the scenes. Um, and to illustrate that, I need to go back to the code here. So let me, um, let me go back to this code. I have this, essentially I have this inline future thing that's using the yield. And again, what the thing, what's happening with that yield is it's taking the code and punting it out to a process pool. And then when that work completes, it comes back. Okay, so that, that's what's happening. Um, the way that this works under the covers is a little bit frightening, actually. Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm uncommenting a piece of code that just prints out what the current execution thread of the, of the program is. And what you, will, what you will find if you do that is, is sort of this behavior. Um, it essentially starts running in kind of the main thread, and then it hops to a totally different execution thread afterward. This is something that's a little bit actually frightening if you've done like thread programming in, in some sense. What happens is your code like starts in one thread and then all of a sudden it's running in a different thread at some point, unbeknownst to you. Like, uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's actually what's happening in this, in this code, okay? But Mike cuts out every now and then. Um, and what is actually, what's going on behind the scenes of this is that if you're playing around with some of these things like thread pools or process pools or anything like that, um, what happens is when you submit work to, a, to another Python interpreter, you sort of start in the main thread. You submit something off, and then when the result comes back, that ends up going to a background thread that's kind of sitting there, kind of hidden behind the scenes. And it turns out that this thread is what triggers callback functions kind of gets the, gets the result back, triggers the callback. And so what ends up, what ends up uh, happening here is um, if you do this little trick with process pools is that the, the code starts running in kind of the main thread. You then cut it in half across that yield statement. And then when you do that, the rest of the code actually wakes up running in a completely different thread than it started. That is a little frighteningly weird actually I mean I, I could think of like a lot of things that could go wrong pulling a stunt like that um, you know like like if you were messing around with things like thread local storage or something like that where it's like okay you start in one thread and all of a sudden wake up in another um, it just I, it, it, it's like it's already kind of mind-boggling but this is like adding like a whole new level of like insane mind-boggling debugging to it um, and the, the reason that, that I'm kind of exploring this is I think um, if you're gonna mess around with, with like crazy tricks involving the yield statement, keep in mind the yield statement, you're doing really weird things with control flow, like all this future stuff and suspending and waking up. Um, there are some potentially horrible implications of that underneath the covers. Like, uh, you know, here I have this whack-a-mole game, right? Where it's like, oh, your, your code wakes up, but it's like in a different, to entirely different context than where it started. That is a little bit, that's a little bit frightening. Does any, I mean, does anybody else find that a little bit frightening, perhaps? That, that yeah, okay, at least one, th thank you in the back. 
validating me there. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's a little bit frightening. Um, but there's something, there's something else going on uh, with this whole thing, too. Um, it turns out that the yield statement actually doesn't say anything about implementation of, of this at all. Like if you were writing one of these, uh, one of these functions that's using the yield, we were saying, yeah, okay, yield from this pool. There's nothing in there that says anything about how that is supposed to happen. It just says, okay, I'm yielding from a pool. Somehow, somewhere, some way, I'm going to get woken up with a result. But nothing in this actually says anything about how you're supposed to do it. Like there's no, you know, kind of the key thing is like no formulaic, you know, rule that says, well, you have to do it this way that I just did. In fact, uh, one of the things that you could do is actually think about, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do some completely different thing under the, under the covers. Like I could, I could say, well, instead of doing all that stuff with futures, like, okay, forget about all that callback function stuff and all, and all that. I could actually just write maybe a, like a, like a different kind of execution function where I just say run inline thread you give me a generator. This one um, actually dispenses with the whole task business entirely. I mean, it just says, ah, forget that. I'm just gonna, I'm basically just gonna step the whole generator. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Essentially, it's just gonna step the whole generator just step by step by step until it's done. No callback function, just totally different execution model. And, um, and you can try other experiments. You could say, okay, well, let's, uh, so I have this totally different thing here. It's just like, I'm gonna, just going to step it. And then um, maybe I'll just try something totally different, like, um, I don't know, just like mix it with a thread pool or something like that. This is, this is like where it gets completely insane, where it's like, okay, I'm going to have code that has both a process pool and a thread pool in it at the same time, because why not, right? I mean, the head is already fully exploded, so... Uh, uh, so you, you 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 can do something like that. So let me let me let me uh, let me let me pull that up. Um, so so here what I've got is I have a function this this compute fibs that just does this you know yield yield from a pool. Um, the pool in this case this is this is basically for processes for CPU work. Okay, so that that's what's happening there. So this this yield statement here is actually going to execute on that. And then, uh, and then what I'm doing is um, down here, I'm actually creating a thread pool where I'm just going to submit jobs to that to run like an inline future in, in a dedicated thread. So the, the model here is I'm gonna have like two different threads running that task and each task is gonna be submitting things out to a process pool. Again, there'll be a there'll be some kind of trivia quiz uh, quiz thing about this later on. Um, so so you can you can you can try experiments like that. I don't know. Let's let's see if it let's see if it actually runs. So again, we're doing a little performance test here, where right now it's doing just sequential execution, six point eight you know six point three seconds, and now it's doing this thing with two different threads on process pools, and it still runs twice as fast. It's, it's like hmm. All right, kind of, kind of curious what's going on there. Uh, if, you, if you put that in things like this print statement to see how it's actually executing, um, one of the things that you'll find is, um, okay, well, that one looks like it's, oh, that's the old one. Um, the, the new one that's running in parallel, you actually find that the code is executing in two different threads, and it's just alternating between threads. It actually ends up behaving in like a totally much more sane, uh, sane manner there. All right. Um, I don't know if whether I want to dwell on that a whole lot, but um, yeah, other than the, uh, what, what, the, the, the the comment, you know, like move along faster, must move faster to escape like certain peril with what we're. Uh, uh, certain do, certainly doing here. Um, I, I think the you know kind of the, the the big idea again with bad movie reference here uh, is that you know with with messing around with things like generators and control flow, you actually have a lot of power to kind of mold what is going on behind the covers. Like you know having like different execution models, event loops, threads, and so forth. I'm not sure that 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 whole area has been fully explored. Really, I mean it's. I don't know, maybe it doesn't 
maybe it shouldn't be explored anymore. I don't know. But it's, uh, there's, it seems like there's a lot of uh, sort of possibilities there as far as like how that yield statement uh, gets executed. All right, so, so there's that. Again, I'm not, sh not sure I want to totally dwell on that too, too much here. But let me, let me just pause, see if there's comments or concerns about that. Okay, kind of, kind of escaping the, the gill a little bit. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then some final, we're going to get into a, a couple of uh, a sort of different directions here. Um, this, this, this section six is going to explore yet another kind of thought on generators. Let me see how... Now we're doing on time here. Okay, I think we're doing okay. Um, one of the things that's a, that, that, that's a little bit odd with, uh, do you know why this is cutting out in the back? Am I touching the mic in a weird, weird way? Okay. Um, he, he, here's kind of a, a kind of an odd thing with, with generators. And maybe this is like a sure sign that I need to get out more or something. Probably, uh, pro probably true. Um, has, any, has anyone kind of noticed like the similarity between, between like a coroutine and a, what's known as an actor? There's this whole thing in concurrency known as the actor model, which is you have, uh, you have essentially actors which are tasks that you send messages to. Like you have, you have these like tasks and you send them messages. And one of the things that's always kind of struck me a little, as, as a little bit odd is the fact that um, you could make generator objects you know, like, like this, is, this is something that I had earlier where you, you make like, you know, spam, you yield, and you create this thing, you advance it to the, to the next, and it becomes this thing that you send things to. I, d I did this example very early on um, where you create, you have this function, it's just sitting there, and it's like receiving messages. It's like you, 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 you send in data, and um, it just responds to whatever you, you send in. Um, this has always struck me as a little bit interesting because it, there, there is this thing known as you know, the, the actor model for concurrency where you make, uh, you make tasks in, a, in some sense. You make these actor tasks. And what these actor tasks do is they, um, they, they do things like receive messages. They send messages to other actors. Um, they can create new tasks. And uh, one other feature is they don't share state at all. So what you have is you have these, these little actor objects kind of all connected together, and they, they sort of send messages to each other. Yes? Is this Not in this, and we'll get to that. Yeah, so, um, so, so this, this actor model, yeah, the question was, do they have a, do they have a queue? Um, and here, here's kind of the, the question. Are coroutines or generators in any way sort of related to this? Or can they be used to do this, this sort of thing? Um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why, I, why I, th I sort of think about that is that in some sense, these generator functions are really simple. I kind of like the idea that they're really stripped down, right? It's like, oh, it's just a simple function. That's, it's receiving messages. And there's not like this whole like class wrapped around it. It's not a whole lot of, a lot of machinery around it. So uh, sort of look at that and say, well, that's kind of, kind of interesting and, 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 and you know can I build like an like an actor system out of that is, is, is there some way that I could kind of fake like it like the actor model with this so what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is a is a little example that looks like like this uh, you know could I could I build code that did a little like a little trick like this where I, where I would actually have some way to sort of declare an actor like I could say okay this printer function is an actor. It receives a message, maybe prints it out, and then uh, maybe in some other bit of code, I have the ability to send it a message. I could say, "Hey, uh, printer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you a message." You know, could I could I fake something like that? Um, and so, here, here's here's a way that you that you could pr possibly fake that. Um, so so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a um, like a little registry. Of actors, okay. So I'm gonna make a little little dictionary here, and then I'm, what I'm gonna do is write a um, a decorator function that just says, okay, this is an actor. You give me a function, and essentially, um, what what's what's gonna happen with this um, this decorator is I'm going to um, essentially start the function. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little bit of code to make a generator where I I start it. 
and then I'm going to advance to the yield, which is kind of a requirement there. And then I'm going to just, uh, I'm just going to stick it in, the, uh, in this registry here. And I'll, I'll, I'll do something like that. So you will see how this works in a second. So the, what, what's happening here is it's like, I'm just, okay, I have this decorator. You wrap it around a function. And what you can do is you can say, okay, this is, this is going to be an actor. I'm going to say, here's an actor. It's called printer. Something, something like that. Okay, so you, you declare a function like that. And then what, what happens, the way that this works, is if you, if you say printer, all of a sudden it, it, it will insert something into this, into this registry that I created, saying, oh, there's this printer associated with this, this generator object. And then what I'm going to do is define a send message or send method where you give me, like, the name of something along with a message. And then all I'm going to do is just kind of uh, do something like that. Where I just kind of look it up and I say, oh, okay, send it a message. So what, what I'm doing is I'm saying, doing something like, oh, you can send printer, you know, the message hello. Okay, it's so a little bit of a little bit of indirection there, but that's 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 kind of what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm making a little like a little little actor system doing that. Everybody kind of see what's going on. I have a sort of a registry of all these little named tasks, and then I'm gonna send them stuff. Yeah. No, the registry is just a registry, basically. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, the send is is sending it there. Um, th actually, the reason for having the registry, by the way, is um, to be able to do things like this. This 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 is where this gets kind of wild. It's it's like okay, if this is truly actors, or something that that looks like actors. Um, okay, so. Yeah, kind of, kind of did an example that that actually works. Um, maybe I could pull out some really insane example, like uh, recursive ping pong. This is something that the stackless Python people have used as an example for a while. It's kind of a, a it's, it's kind of a mind bending example to show show something interesting. Like um, the idea here is I'm going to make an actor called ping, like this, that just sits in an infinite loop. And then gets a message. So I'm going to say, okay, get a, get a message. And then and then and then basically, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is uh, I'll print it out. Okay, so print out like ping, along with the message. And then um, and then what it does immediately after that is sends a message to another actor called Pong. I don't know. Maybe I'll do message plus one or something like that. So you have it. You have an actor like this. Um, and then you have another one called Pong. Like that. So what, what I have here is I have like two, two of these, these actors that they receive messages, but then what they're doing is like sending it like in a recursive cycle. Okay, so I have like ping sends to Pong, and then Pong receives a message and sends it back to ping. And this thing is essentially supposed to set up an infinite message cycle in the, in the system. It turns out if they, that if you're working with like actual actor tasks in like a concurrency framework or something like that, they can usually handle this. It might make your head hurt or something like that, but it's it, essentially you have tasks that are sort of sending messages in a, in a big cycle like that. Um, uh, th th that this this example, by the way, is partly why I have that special send function. Is I don't know how to I don't know how to do a recursive cycle send unless I have both things in existence. It's kind of well, it's a little it's a little little odd there. But uh, so you, so you could have something like that. You can say, okay, well that's that's pretty odd. Let's create like a ping task and a pong task. So now this uh, now the registry has like pong printer and ping in it. And then you could, you could ask this question, well, what happens if I send ping like a message, like if I send it zero? Um, is the whole universe going to explode at this point? Or you know, what, what's going to happen at, the, at this point? And um, it, it, it turns out it sort of fails miserably in, in some way. Essentially what happens is it comes up and it says, well, okay, you got ping zero, pong one. 
And then what ends up happening is it tries to send back into ping, and then the whole thing explodes. And the reason that it explodes is that, um, is that Python thinks that the, jet, that, 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 that the ping generator is already executing. And so what you're trying to do is like recursively invoke a generator function that's already in the process of doing something and it just, Python just says like, no, you know, you know, not, not going to, uh, uh, not going to do that at all. Okay. So it's, it's like, okay, that's, that's, that's just a bad idea. Okay. So it, it doesn't work uh, because it's, you're, you're trying to, trying to, trying to recursively call into something that's already, already running. So if you look at that, you, you sort of realize that, okay, things like, like generators, not really quite the same as like an actor. I mean, it's like it has the send method on it, but it actually turns out that there's a bunch of stuff missing. Like it doesn't allow things like concurrent execution. Um, it doesn't allow asynchronous message delivery. These, these are some things that, that people get in these like, like actor, actor frameworks as they want that. Um, you also are, are sort of bound by normal Python rules. Like the send method is just like a normal function call. And you're kind of bound by the same limits of involving things like recursion, um, the call stack, thing, uh, things like that. So, uh, so, you, so, you, so you, have some, you have some problems with that. But then if you, um, if you kind of think about it, like how could you, how could you fix this? Like you know, could you make it work? by doing some kind of clever trick. Um, one of the things that you could try is maybe a, is, is wrapping a generator with a thread. Kind of the idea here is you, you would create maybe a message queue or something like that, and then you have a, a method that just sort of runs the thing in a thread and pulls things off a queue. I don't want to go in that direction. It's like, let's, let's not do that. Um, you could try something else, which is to... Uh, Maybe write like a little, like a little message scheduler here. Um, what what is going on with this? Is I'm gonna I'm gonna re-implement the the send method to maintain like a little like a little message queue. So what I'm gonna do is make a a, a message queue, and then I'm gonna re-implement the um, the send method so that all it does is it just queues up the message. along with a, with a name, essentially. Okay, so, uh, so what's, what's happening here is this thing will basically uh, queue up messages. So if, like I, if I said something like send to the printer or the message hello, it doesn't actually do anything yet. What, what, it ends up hap what ends up happening is it just ends up queuing this stuff up, saying, okay, here's, here's a bunch of messages. It's like one is going to printer hello, the other one's going to printer 42, and so forth. Um, and then what it could do is write a... Um, write a support function, I don't know, maybe a run function, that all it does is it just cycles as long as this message queue is, has stuff in it. You know, some, some, something like that. And then, um, and then sends in a message like that. So what you have is you have, um, this this will essentially run the messages, and send them into uh, send them into these code routines. Let me just pause for a second. We're gonna kind of st still with me on what's going on there. Again, trying to use uh, trying to use generators as as little little tasks there. Okay, um, and you can look at that and say, well, would something like that work with this ping pong example that I just did? You know, keep in mind that this that this, uh, you know, this, this registry has this you know, Pong task and the printer task and the ping task. And um, keep in mind that those, those, those functions are essentially recursively like sending data to each other. So again, ping is basically sending something to Pong and then Pong is sending something back to ping. Would something like this message queue business and this run method, would it make that work? Could I, could I come in here and say, you know, ping of, or could I say send of ping um, the, the message zero, and then if I started running it, would the thing wake up and start running? And it does not. Let's see what happened. Uh, let me see what happened here. So 
Stop iteration. Okay, message send. Okay, I have to, I have to look at my code here. I might have a bug in the code. Um, while true, send. Uh, hmm. Oh, I know why it's not working. It's, it's not working because the, the thing terminated earlier. And like, okay, let's, let's, let's recreate it here. Okay, so, um, okay so, so now the thing is basically running in like an infinite recursive cycle between the two. So you have like ping sending a pong, pong sending a ping. It's going in a cyclic loop over and over and over and over again. Um, that's a little, that's a little, that's a little wild. I mean, in some in some sense, what's happened is we've again escaped Python's like recursion limit. You have two different you have two different functions that are like calling each other, again in a recursive cycle like that. And you're outside of the normal rules of like Python recursion and so forth. Yeah, question. What does it mean for us to generate it using all these executions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is like, what does it mean for a generator to be executing? Um, I guess a generator, it's always in, it's like a generator f or a generator object, you're either actually running it, like you've, you've, like you've actually called like the send method, and it's in the process of doing something but it has not reached the yield yet. Or if the thing is just completely suspended. Like when a generator hits the yield statement, it just stops, and then it goes into this, like, this suspended state. Um, so, so because it's in that suspended state, if you were to unsuspend it, you could resuspend it, and it's still just not working. Yeah, the reason I got the error, the question is why did I get the error before, is that what happened is I sent, I, I, ba I basically called send, which, Took, it, it, it like took a piece of data and then sent it to another generator, but then that generator tried to send it back into myself. And the problem is, um, I actually had not gone. I have not reached the next yield statement. So the problem is like that send was basically setting up a recursion, but I had not reached the yield statement. So it came back and said, "Well, you, I don't know what you're doing, but you haven't you haven't hit the yield statement. So you're you're kind of in a running a running state." I'm not sure whether that answers your question or not, but it's. Is there a way to, to unsuspend the generator? Yeah, you call uh, you call next on it, like like next or send or something like that. So, yeah, I, I, actually, I mean a lot of a lot of generators. Uh, actually, actually, if you make a generator like um, like like if you look at this, the, let's look at this registry here. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this. Uh, uh, pull one of these things out. Actually, I'll pull the, the printer one out. Um, assuming that my terminal doesn't die here. Um, I, think, I think the generator objects actually do have some, some state associated with it. Like there's this uh, GI running. This, this is basically a flag that indicates whether the thing is actually executing or not. Like inside, you know, inside the code. You could look at that. Um, it's a little bit hard to uh, to maybe to sort of see that, but like like when I when I would if I were to run the thing and say you know send in you know to printer like like that, I would say oh got forty two. When it was actually producing that output, then that GI running would be set to true, essentially saying hey you're running. But once it suspends again, it's, it gets set to false. Okay. Um, now, you know, I, I guess looking at this, you say, okay, where is where is where's Dave going exactly with this? Um, you know, I, I, you know, sort of sort of looking at this um, at this example, it is still sort of a fake actor in some sense. I mean, I'm doing some kind of weird little trick with messaging and generators and so forth. Um, I guess I guess maybe the the idea of doing that is not so much to get into concurrency or actors or any or anything like that, but really to just explore this idea that the yield statement again, sort of lets you, I don't know, bend the space time continuum or something like that. I mean, in, in, in some sense, you're taking a, you're taking this problem that involves like recur like an infinite recursive cycle. You're doing some trick with the yield statement. You know, maybe running some things in the background, and somehow you're es you're escaping the bounds of the recursion limit or something. I mean, that's a it's a little it's a little weird, a little crazy. I mean, it's uh you know it's, it's, it's maybe just it's maybe just something to kind of kind of think about, you know, ponder for the next day or something like that. So uh, so 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 there is that, um, and then the uh, 
Well, let me let me see if there's other questions about that. We're we're about to jump off the complete deep end in a, in a <laughs> second here. So. Um, yeah, the question was, can you combine it with the, uh, what, the previous half or the, oh, the process pool stuff? Um, maybe. Or maybe thread pools or something. I'd have to think about that, but yeah, maybe. All right. Well, the, 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 uh, the final thing that we're going to, yeah, uh, uh, I know, we'll see, we're, we'll see how this, uh, this, this lasts. Does anybody into the red green show? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so a uh, terrifying visitor here. So um, I was thinking, like, well, how, how would it, how would, what would be a good way to end this tutorial? Like, what, what would be something sort of, uh, sort of crazy to, to end with? Um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to end with by writing a compiler. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so regret this uh, uh, later on. Okay, so, um, and, and, and so, so what we're going to do, and you're going to say, okay, God, where, where is Dave going with this? We, we actually have a little time to, to kind of spend on this. Um, I'm going to write a compiler for basically evaluating mathematical expressions. And, and the primary reason why is that the eval function is just for the weak, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> why would I do that? You know, I've got to do it my, myself, basically. So, um, so if, you've, if you've never seen this, this done before, it's kind of an interesting exercise. Um, Essentially, the, the idea on writing a compiler is that you need to take a bunch of input text, like a, take like, a, like an expression like that, uh, break it down into tokens, and then from there, you're going to turn it into some kind of tree structure that represents the structure of that, that math expression. You have to capture things like the fact that the multiply is a stronger operator than the plus and the minus and so forth. Um, and then you're going to have um, some code that, that walks a parse tree and somehow produces a result. Like, it's like, I have nine. Okay, you know, it's like, it's almost, it's almost too simple as to, um, uh, to how to do that. So let's write a compiler, basically. It's like, oh, okay, well, how, how, how would you do that? Um, there's going to be a little bit of set. Actually, there's going to be a lot of setup on this. You're going to wonder, like, where is this going exactly? But... Bear with me. Uh, I think I think it will it'll pay off. So, um, first thing that you have to do to do a compiler is you have to figure out how to tokenize an input text. Now, this is some uh, some sample code uh, for doing that, and I thought it would. Uh, I, we, you know, I'm actually doing okay on time, so I thought it would kind of pull apart a little bit about how this actually works because it's kind of kind of interesting. Okay, so. Um, in order to, to, to do like a, like a tokenizing step, what you have to do is you have to take input text and break it up into sort of this string of objects that describe what it is. Like if you say two plus three times four minus five, well, that's a number, it's the plus sign, it's a number, it's the time sign, it's a number, the minus sign, and the number. And then you have values here like, well, it's two plus three times four minus so forth. So you're taking text and kind of, kind of breaking it up. Um, part of the reason for doing that uh, in, in this tutorial is that it's an opportunity to bring regexes into the mix because <laughs> why, why not, right? Okay, so, um, so, so here's, 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 some, here's I'll, I'll, we'll do like a little, like just a couple of examples of just like like how this actually works. Um, one one of the ways that you can do this is you just make like a little like a little list of kind of your token specifiers using um, what are uh, known as named capture groups with regexes. Okay, so what you can do is you can say, well, there, there's the regex for a number, for instance, and then and then you can say, well, here's the I'll I'll just do like a kind of a simple one. Here's a here's a regex for the plus sign. You never have too many weird escape codes in there as, as well. And then you can, um, uh, let's, let's do minus sign as well. Okay, so minus sign. So what you, so what you do is you, you sort of write out like little, little, little tokens for stuff. I, actually, I might as well just do the whole, the, whole, the whole thing and pray that I don't make a typo in this whole, uh, uh, this whole thing here. Did I make a typo? Ah, shit, okay. Um, well, actually, no, it's, it's, a, it's a Python list. I can, I can fix it later. Okay, so. Um, divide, okay. 
Um, I'm, I'm sure something will go wrong with this, and I'll have to copy the code from somewhere else. But that's uh, that, that, that's okay. So, um, and then white white that's basically white space there. Okay, so there, there's 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 my tokens list. Um, I screwed up one of them, so I'm gonna I'm gonna delete that out of there. Um, that was tokens minus three, maybe. That's one minus two. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so, so there's, there's your list of tokens. Uh, these are basically describing, did, did I nuke the wrong one again? Ah, okay. Well, let's see, which one is that? Tokens, uh, it's minus three <laughs> equal, uh, okay. And I need a P on it too, okay. Okay, Dave crashes and burns and... Uh, I think that's okay. Okay, so so so, um, so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna write out your tokens. Essentially, what you're saying here is this is you know you have the rules for the different different things, and then what you what you can do is you can kind of turn this into a like a master regular expression. What what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take like the uh, the vertical bar and join join all those together like that. So it's going to make kind of like a like a master master regex. So so I'm going to I'm going to say like master re is equal to re compile join all my all my tokens together. And then uh, so this this is some this is some regular expression. And then the idea is that if you have a bunch of text like let's say you had two like your text was 2 plus 3 times 4 minus 5, um, you can start matching that text against that, that pattern. Like you could, you could say, um, you know, master re match text, and then some match object will come back and it will say, oh yeah, okay, here's, here's your match object. Oh, I matched the number two. Um, one of the things that you can do with, with, with these matches is actually find out information like, um, like, what the, uh, like what the match was, uh, as, as well as the, like you can say, like last group, for instance, will tell you that the name of the pattern that got matched, it will say, oh, that was a number, actually. And then you, could, you can actually get the, uh, like the text as well, like two. So there's, there's, kind, of, there's kind of ways you can, you can basically, you, like you can, you, can, you can do this. Um, one of the things that, that you can do is use a secret feature of the, the RE module. This, this is my, um, actually, this will be my payback for the core developers um, breaking the tab key in Python 3.4 is that I'm going to tell everybody about an undocumented feature of Python that's been around for at least 10 years that they don't want you knowing about. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is a um, so, so very obscure feature of the RE module is, um, is, is this. Let me, um, okay, I have, this, I have this master RE. And there's a there's a method of regular expression objects, in, on on that that has been available for as long as I can remember. This might go back as far as Python two, maybe even earlier. Um, it's the the scanner method. How many people know about the scanner method of RE? A couple of people. Do you know about the scanner method? Have you used it for? Uh, yeah. Do you do you think it's like officially blessed or not? I I don't think it's. I think it's awesome. Um, so if you, if you call that, um, you'd say, oh, master, oh, f oh, first of all, you have to get the help on it. Okay, so master RE scanner. No doc string, okay? <laughs> they don't want you looking at it. Um, it turns out this is not documented online. It's not in the RE docs. There's no doc strings on it. Um, and you can, you can say, well, what in the world is that? What you can do is you can say, what you do is you say master RE scanner and then you give it some text. You get like a scanner object back. Um, you know, like, what is that? Um, this is actually a really cool feature. Um, what it will do is it will sweep over a text string and match the text like one thing at a time for you and feed it to you. Like if you say s.match, it will come back and say, hey, I matched the number two. And then if you call it again, it will say, hey, I matched some white space. You call it again and it's like, hey, I got the plus sign. Well, some more white space. 
There's the number three, the star, the four. Uh, essentially what it's doing is it's like doing a sweep over a bunch of text, one token at a time. And you can, you can use it to tokenize stuff. So, um, so you can actually use that to build like a little, like a little tokenizer. Let me pull up, I'll, I'll pull up some code uh, so I don't have to keep typing it all the time here and just, and just kind of, kind of, kind of show you that. Um, so, so here's, here's, here's the thing that you can do. You can write little tokens and then you can end up writing like a little, like a little tokenize function, like something, something like that. Since you're using this scanner object, it's going to feed a bunch of tokens back. Um, and what that will do is just make a, uh, make like a little, like a little token string for you. Here's, here's, here's how that would work. You could say uh, like, like tokes is equal to uh, tokenize two plus three times four minus five. Of course, in, the, in, the, in this tutorial, it's going to come back as a generator object because why not? You know, if you don't, don't like generators, you shouldn't be here uh, in, the, in the first place. So if you turn it into a list, it'll come back and say, well, okay, there's, there's, your, there's your token string. Okay, so first part of writing a compiler is to do, do that. Do a, little bit of, uh, do a little bit of tokenizing, essentially. Um, the second part of, uh, of doing this is to write a, um, a parser of some kind. Now, this is by far the most evil part of this um, because we're essentially talking about, like, the first five weeks of, like, a compiler course at the university where the guy is, you know, <laughs> instructor will, will come up and, like, prove all sorts of horrible theorems about LL, LR parsing, all sorts of things, uh, uh, which, which, of course, I'm going to do now because I used to be a professor. But no, it, but essentially what you're doing is kind of matching, a gr like, a grammar to these, to these tokens. Um, the gist of that, and I'm not going to, go into huge detail is that you have to have some kind of uh, code that takes these like grammar rules and codes them up in some way and ultimately what you're going to do is try to turn this into a tree so um, so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, kind of skip the parsing step for a second and talk about the tree building part of this because it, it's sort of the more interesting part um, the, the 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 goal of this of this parser is essentially to build up like a bunch of like a bunch of tree node. This thing keeps cutting out on me, and bothering me. But um, so 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 here, here's kind of the idea. Um, I'm going to make some way of representing like different objects in this thing that I'm parsing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sort of a class that represents uh, sort of a node in this in this tree in this tree. And I, I, admittedly, I'm doing a little bit of kind of a code simplification hack here. Um, what I'm, what I'm doing here is, um, is kind of a way of initializing a value. What I'm doing is, is taking a bunch of input arguments, zipping them with some field names, and then setting them on myself. If you've never seen that trick before, it's kind of a cute little thing. But the, the idea is that I can then make like other things that inherit from that, where I say, oh, this is a binary operator, and the fields are like an operator a left side and a right side. And then I can make things like, oh, there's a number node, and the fields of that are maybe like a value or something. Okay, so, so what I'm doing here is making like little data structures, and the idea is that if I wanted to represent like the number two, I could say, oh, that's like, uh, that's like the number two. And it comes back and say, oh, there's a number object. And the value of it, the value of it is, is two. And then if I wanted to have like the number three, you know, like, well, it, it's the same, it's like, so if you wanted to have number two, you do that. If I wanted to represent like an operator, I could say, well, that's a, bi a binary operator plus that happens to represent like the number two and the number three or something. And then what would happen here is that um, that thing would basically have like an op saying, oh, it's the plus operator. And then the left side would be a number. And then the right side would be a number and so forth. So what's going to happen in this, in, this, in this sort of compiler thing is we're actually going to build up a tree structure of sorts that represent what we're, what we're working with. So just as an example of that, if, if, that is the, if this is the expression that you're working with, the way that that might get represented in the system is you would sort of build it up maybe incrementally in some way like you would you would say okay well there's like 
like we're going to make a, a binary operator, which is the plus operator, and then the left-hand side of that is going to be the number two. Okay, so there, there's, there's the two there. And then the right-hand side of that might be a binary operator like times, where the left-hand side is the number three, and the right-hand side is the number four. So you might, you might start with that, and then you would create like another one saying, well, this is the binary operator like minus, where the left-hand side is that N1 that I just made up, and then the right-hand side is the number five. Okay, so what you're doing is you're kind of building up uh, sort of a little, a little tree structure um, that, looks, that looks something like this. So you're going you're gonna to build up this, this, this tree structure to do that. Um, the code to do that, unfortunately, is a little bit nasty. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I've actually coded it up. You can find it kind of in the, in the class notes or the, 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 uh, the class page. You can say, you can, you can actually look at an implementation of how that works. Um, essentially, the idea of it is that you're going to have some parsing code that is essentially building up these structures like binary operators and numbers and so forth, and you end up with a, um, with a, with a little like, tree of nodes, essentially. Okay, so that's uh, so that that's 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 how you that's how you do that um, is is building up building up little little you know nodes and, and trees and so forth so forth like that. Uh, let me let me just pause see whether is everyone kind of okay with what's uh, what's going on there. Again, we're going to have you know some some parse tree that has has all these nodes in it, and where this is where this is going is. Again, as, 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 a, as a former professor, I can simply say this is left as an exercise to the reader to fully, uh, to, to fully uh, represent parsing there. Um, where, where I'm actually going with this is more into the manipulation of these trees. Um, let's say you actually created a big tree structure like this. Okay, so you have, you have this, this, this structure of all these nodes, like you know, binary operator and numbers and so forth, you build up this 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 large tree structure. How do you deal with that? Like, what is the like what is the mechanism for dealing with like a nested tree structure like that? How do you like how do you navigate through it? How would you even print it out? You know, like how would you even view it? So, uh, a very standard way of doing that is to implement something known as the visitor pattern. It's kind of a it's it's kind of a a, a neat little trick. Um, uh, what I'm what I'm going to do is is just kind of just kind of illustrate what this visitor pattern is about. Um, the the idea is that you have all of these you have these different kinds of nodes, right? You have a binary operator, you have a number, and you might have more. Like in a re, like in a real system, this thing keeps cutting out. Um, you would have like different all sorts of different objects, like numbers and variables and so forth. What you're gonna what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a little class called node visitor and you're gonna do a little magic trick in here where you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a visit method on here where you hand me a node and then what it's going to do is figure out like a name where it's gonna say, you know what, I'm gonna make a name where I take the word visit underscore and then what I'm gonna do is add like the um, like the type of the node Along with like the the name of the the name of it, I'm kind of what I'm doing is I'm kind of taking like the like the type name of the node object, making a new name out of it, and then um, what I'm going to do is just do a horrible weird trick where I do some where I do like where I do something like this. What I'm going to do is call a method on myself using this this new name essentially. So here, here's, here's, here's how this is going to work. If you create one of these things, like if I said v is equal to node, node visitor, and then I said v is equal to visit of, um, you know, like, like a binary operator or something. Like that. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to go in there, and it's actually going to try and trigger a method called visit bin op. Okay, you can kind of, right now it's generating an error, right? It's saying, hey, uh, you don't have visit bin op. So what you end up doing instead is if you wanted to print something out, for instance, 
You would say, oh, I want to make a printer, and I'm going to make printer inherits from node visitor. And then what I'm going to do is implement the different methods. Like I could say, well, for bin op, um, you give me a node, and then what I might do is like recursively call things on it. Like I would say, oh, let's print out, like let's visit the, uh, well, actually I'll, what I'll do here is I'll print out, you know, node.op, and then I'll recursively visit the left side like that. And then maybe I'll have another method here, like visit number. Something like that. So what, you, what you're going to do is you're, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're writing a class where you're implementing these, these various methods. Um, and then the idea is that you could, you could take this printer thing and then pass it like maybe a parse tree and it would just sort of walk through the parse tree triggering the method. Okay, so this is a, this is a fairly standard thing for walking, walking through a tree. There's actually a whole bunch of very interesting stuff going on here, by the way, as far as modern Python. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that's going on is this whole visitor pattern is one way of faking a switch statement. That's kind of what it's doing. You have like a whole bunch of different types of objects, and you're like, well, how do I, uh, like how do I dispatch on the type? I do this little visit hack, kind of like a switch statement. Um, there's also something in Python 3.4 that I will admit I'm not fully got my head wrapped around yet, but there's like this single item, like, like single dispatch feature that got added in 3.4. Uh, I forget, do you, know the, do you know what I'm talking about? Vega? Is there this, there's, no, there's, no, there's this feature. Um, actually, we, we, we have a little time, let me pull that up. Um, if you, go, if you go into like um, what's new in Python 3.4, um, there was this, uh, this, this feature added. Um, single dispatch generic functions. Yeah, PEP 4.43. Um, so um, this, is, this is something that kind of is, is, is related to what I just did. Um, it's, it, what, it, what it lets you do is write functions that kind of uh, dispatch on a type. What you can do is you can say things like, oh, here's a function that responds to integers, and like here's another version of a function that responds to lists, and so forth. It's a, kind, of a, kind of an interesting decorator hack, and so forth. Um, that is also kind of similar to this visit thing in a way. It's like what I'm, what I'm doing in this visitor pattern is I'm saying, hey, this is a class that responds to these different kinds of nodes. I want you to fire a special method related to that. So this, this, is, this is something that's sort of related to that. Again, I have not looked extensively at that enough to, to say much more about it other than it's a new Python 3.4 not 3.4 3, feature that showed up. So, so, so this, is, this, this is the kind of thing that you do is you, you sort of write these little, like these little visitor pattern objects. And it turns out that, that this is a very standard technique for evaluating one of these, one of these parse trees. It turns out if you have a, a, a tree of all, these, of all these nodes, you can actually write um, code that will evaluate it by doing kind of a weird tree walking thing. Um, th this, this is what it looks like to do that. You can say, well, I'm going to make a, uh, like an evaluator class that inherits from node visitor. And then what I'm going to do in here is, is implement um, different things. Like for the number object, maybe I'll just return node.value. Okay, just return the value back. Uh, for the binary operator, what I'll do is um, basically uh, walk into, I'll, I'll basically go down and say, hey, visit the, uh, visit the left side first, and then go visit the, uh, the right side next. Okay, so you would say, okay, go down the right, or go down the left, go down the right, and then what you could do is look at the, the operator and just say, well, okay, if you're, if you're the plus operator, then return left value plus right value. There's, I could probably do this in a more elegant way, but it, it, you essentially are doing like a little, like a little evaluation trick like this. Where you say, okay, now you know, now take the take the minus sign, do that. Um,
we'll, we'll do the full complement here. Okay, so, um, okay, so you, 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 you write code like that. Um, it turns out that that will, that will basically work for evaluating like expressions. The idea is that, you know, let's, let's say you said, you know, tree is equal to parse, you know, two, two plus three times four minus five. Um, my string object is not an iterator. What is going on there? Um, Oh, did I? Oh, okay, duh. Okay, I need to, okay. So what, what you do is you do, to, you essentially say, okay, tokenize two plus three times four minus, somebody gets bonus points for that, by the way. Okay. So, um, so you, you, you essentially come in here and say, okay, parse the tokens, you have your tree. If you want to evaluate it, what you would do is you would say, okay, do create an evaluator and then visit this tree object. And what it will do is just walk through the tree and spit out a value. It says, ah, nine. Yeah. Oh, the, the logic for that was base, was this little evil bit of code here. Um, there's, a, there's essentially a base class. Yeah, the question was how do the types get connected to the methods? Um, there's a, essentially a base class that has a generic visit method in it where you hand it a node and then what it immediately does is look at the type of the node and then rips off the type name. So it turns out for, for things like, like if this were your tree, the type of that, it comes back and says, oh, it's bin op. And then the, the, the type of that or the name of it, it just says, oh, that's, that's bin op. So there's a, little, there's a little bit of magic in the background kind of connecting that up. If you want to if you want to try a different example, you could you could say things like tokens is equal to tokenize. Um, I don't know, like like forty five minus thirty seven plus thirty three plus four times five minus one. You know, there, there, there's there's sort of another example. Essentially, what's what's happening is that's that's creating a big like a big token list. Okay, that's not very descriptive there, but like well, actually, I can just turn it into that. Like, okay, there's there's all of your tokens. And then if you want to turn it into a tree, you could say, okay, parse, parse all of the tokens. Ah, why, why is that? Uh, okay. I'm getting, I'm getting too, got too clever for my own good there, okay. Bad, writing, a, ri writing code that only works with a generator, that's not good. Okay, so, uh, so, you, so you get your tree there, and then, and then you, can, you can basically say, okay, make an evaluator and then visit that. Now come back. Negative 787. Hopefully that's the correct answer. We'll uh, <laughs> take, it on, take it on faith there. So, uh, so, so, so you get into this, this, this tree building stuff. Now, now you can say, okay, where, where, is, where is Dave going with it? Like why, is, why did all of a sudden we go all, all, all down this like compiler rat hole? I mean, what is that about? Well, the, the, the reason for, for going in this direction is that there are evil people in the world. <laughs> and... Um, you know, like, uh, not, not, not to pick on Alex Gaynor or somebody like that, but, you know, he, co he comes to mind, you know, like, you know, Alex Gaynor would come to mind, you say, yeah, okay, that's a, that's a pretty nice little compiler you have there, Dave, uh, and then uh, what, what he would do is, is maybe come up with something like, oh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some text that's equal to the, the plus sign joined up with, uh, I don't know, stir of x for x in range, like, 2,000 or something. You're like, oh, okay, um, that, okay, zero plus one plus two plus three up to 2,000. It's like, yeah, okay. And then and he would say, okay, tokenize, it's like tokenize that. Okay, so you would come up and say tokenize, tokenize your text. To, you know, huge, huge expression. And then, and then you would come up and you'd say, okay, let's parse it, you know, parse, parse tokens. Looks... Looks looks good at this point. I mean, I have a binary operator, but then you would uh, you would you would throw that into this like evaluator thing. Like you would say, okay, go go evaluate it, and then boom, maximum recursion depth while calling a Python object. So you get the thousand level stack trace, and then <laughs> and then Alex is basically laughing, and I was like, ah, your compiler sucks, or you know, you know, whatever. So. Um, <laughs> So, so, so this, this, you know, so the, you take you take something like this visitor pattern thing, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, this is a pretty standard 
you know, compiler trick. Um, you know, and again, going, going through all that stuff that we, that we did there, it's like parsing, that's, that's like a serious CS course. I don't want to, I don't want to get into it too much, but you do get into this, this, this whole like death spiral thing where it's like somebody will hit it with this, um, you know, this horrible expression. And then you realize that this, this visitor pattern is, is essentially plagued by this recursion problem. I mean, it's like, okay, I'm going down the left side, down the right side. Um, essentially what's happening in that, eva in that evaluation is we have this very, very deeply nested tree structure. The thing recursively just goes down the left, and then it hits the recursion limit and just it's dead. I mean, it's, you're, just, you're just dead at that point. And, you know, and again, um, you know, people will, will, will come up and say, yeah, well, you know, I told you that was a terrible idea. This is, this is John McCarthy, inventor of Lisp, you know, saying, yeah, well, you know, you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't uh, be doing that. Don't use Python. Use, I don't know, use some functional language. Uh, use something with tail call, recursion elimination, you know, uh, optimization, that, that kind of stuff. So, um, so you're kind of you're stuck with this. You're saying, oh, okay, um, I don't know. Okay, recursion, it's bad. And it, it kind of raises this question of, well, how would you not do recursion? And actually, even a deeper question, uh, how would you not do anything? <laughs> the yield statement, right? It's like you're at a generator uh, tutorial, right? I mean, you know the answer to this yield statement. Um, could you take something like that and just punt on the recursion? Like, could you, could you take this visitor pattern thing and just say, uh, you know what, recursion, yeah, that does suck. I'm not gonna do it. No, uh, -uh. yield. Like, the, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, you know what, I'm just gonna yield the left node. It's somebody else's problem at that point, right? No, no, it's, it's, it's like, so that's, that's, that's the idea. Is it, could you take the visitor pattern and just use the yield statement to punt it out, saying, no way am I going to do that. I don't want to do it. You know, forget about it. That's a terrible, uh, ter terrible idea to, to, to do that. Um, okay, this is, this is, this is frightening. Um, how in the world would you do something like that? Like, like what, what would you do to make that work? Um, and here is the, I, I'm going to try to go through the trick involved in doing this. This, 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 if you thought the future thing was insane, this will uh, sort of take it up a notch. Um, the way that this is going to work is I'm going to write a slight variation of, the, uh, of that visit method that, that does kind of the same trick, but um, what, it, what it's going to do, though, is it's going to have this magic, like, use of the yield from. Um, so, so the, the thinking on this, okay, so, so here's the idea. Um, it's going to essentially trigger, like, the visit method, and then it's going to look at the result and wrap it with a, with a, a, a generator of some kind. Now, this is, let, let, me, let me see if I can, uh, let, let me type this up, because this is, this is utterly sort of mind-boggling, the way that this is going to work here. So, so what I'm going to have is I'm going to have this, this class node visitor, and I'm going to put this gen visit method on there. And it's actually going to do the same, the exact same thing that I did before, which is, which is I'm going to take the, uh, I'm going to take the name visit, and I'm going to add in the, um, the type of the node name. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this, the, the exact same thing that I did before. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the, um, I'm going to call the, the, the function. I'm going to say, okay, invoke this name. Okay, so, so trigger the thing, but then this is the, this is the really bizarre magic trick. Um, I'm going to turn the result into a generator. Always. So, so, so here's, here's the way that this is going to work. Um, I'm going to do a little check on the result um, that essentially does, one, th one of the things it's going to do is it's going to check to see whether it's already a generator. Okay, so that's, that's what this little trick is doing, is it's sort of saying, hey, if it's already a generator, um, I'm actually going to just, um, do I just do, do, I do it 
Yeah, I think I just did it. Did I do? I think I just did return yield from uh, from result. Is that what I did in this? I better double check this because it's uh, return. Oh, result. Okay, well, it's, it's, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, result equals, um, no, wait a minute. Let me, let me just double check. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. So if, it, if it's a generator, um, I'm just going to do that, and then, um, and then I'm going to return the result otherwise. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, with that, and you can, you can look at that and say, okay, God, what, what, in the, what is that doing? Okay, so... Uh, so we're, we're going to start with that. Here, here is the, the thinking on that. Um, let's, say I have, let's say I have a node that's like a number, like number node. There's my, there's my number object. Um, it has a, it has, a, has a value on there. Um, if I call this, um, this gen visit thing, so let, let's, say I had a, let, let's, let's say I had a evaluator. Where I said if I have an evaluator that inherits from node visitor, and let's say I had some method like visit number on there. And I said return node.value. If I come in here and I say, okay, let's, let's make an evaluator, and I say E equals gen visit on this node, it's gonna come back and say, hey, it's generator object. That's what this is doing. It's sort of saying, like, whatever, what it, it essentially turned that into a generator object. And you can say, hmm, okay, generator object. Interesting. Uh, since it's a generator, you can do things like call next on it. I have to redo it here. Okay, so you get a generator, you call next on it, it immediately uh, stops with a stop iteration exception. Comes back right away. It's like, oh, there was nothing to iterate. However, there's something kind of kind of curious about that. The result of that came back in the exception. It said, oh, it's a stop iteration three. That is what is going on there. It's like, essentially, it returned a value back, and it said, hey, uh, here's the value. It, oh, it happens to be in an exception. I, I kind of apologize for that. That's a little weird, but it's in, a, in an exception. Um, so so for, for simple things like that, it's going to turn it into a generator, and the object that, it, and if you run it, it's going to pop the value out on a stop iteration. Still, uh, still sort of with me on, uh, with me on that. Um, now, for the more complicated things, let's let's go back to the slides here. Okay, so so first part of this um, is if you just have a method, just returns a simple value, it's just gonna it's just gonna pop out using stop iteration like that. Um, if you have something slightly more complicated, like uh, like this binary, like this bin op thing, um, what is going to happen there is something a little bit more uh, uh, more interesting. Let me uh, l let me let me pull up a little bit of, of code for that um, because I don't want to I don't want to type it type it all in here. So let me let me. Uh, let me just. Uh, I, I want to. I don't want to run this right away here. So let, let me let me do this. So so what, what we're going to have now is let's say you have um, let's say you made one of these evaluator objects, and let's say you had a different kind of node where you said okay node is equal to a bin op, where it's a plus operator. The left is a number three. The right is a number four. Like that. And let's say I I, I passed that in. And I said okay. Um, you know, e gen visit node. Okay, this is gonna, uh, th this is this is essentially gonna come back with a um, a generator as well, but this one is gonna this one is gonna behave a little bit differently. Um, if you if you call next on that, it's gonna essentially produce the number object out. Keep in mind the uh, the, the code for this. Well, let, me, let me go back to the. code. The, the code for this. Um, the, 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 uh, the code for this, by the way, is essentially um, that. Okay, so this, this is what's going on here. This bin op is essentially yielding the left node, and then it's yielding the right node, and then doing, doing some kind of evaluation on it. So what, what is happening here in this, in this 
in this new version is that you call next on it and you see this, uh, this sort of number object kind of pops out of it. It says, hey, there's a, there's a number on there. Um, you, can, you can sort of say, well, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, what you're supposed to do at that point is actually evaluate the number. We're going to piece this together in a second. But the idea is that this thing is going to pop out a number, and then I'm supposed to evaluate it. Like, I'm, I'm actually supposed to take care of that. And when I'm done uh, taking care of it, I'm actually supposed to send in the result. Like, if I look at the, uh, at the, at the number object, there's the number object. That actually has some, some value associated with it. I'm supposed to take that and then send it back in. So what I'm supposed to do is say, okay, so, you, know, you gave me a number. I'm going to evaluate it. I'm going to send it back in to you. So, so what's happening here is that that three that I sent in is like the result of the yield. It's kind of like you yielded, you gave me a number, I'm going to do something with it, and then I'm going to send you the result in. So I sent that in, and then a new number popped out. You're like, hmm, what's, what's that? Um, that's actually the right-hand side that popped out. So a new number popped out. I'm supposed to now evaluate that. Okay, so uh, what I'm supposed to do is figure it out, send that in. Maybe I'll, I'll send it back in saying, hey, okay, there's four. When I send it back in, all of a sudden the thing stops with a stop iteration saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not running anymore. But by the way, the result is seven. Your head should be like totally exploding at this point. Uh, uh, you know, wh wh what, is, what is happening behind the scenes of this thing is that in this, in this version with the yield, um, you're sort of using the yield to kick out nodes. You're sort of saying, hey, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with the left node. Here it is. You deal with it. Um, the code behind the scenes is going to figure that out, send in a result to like left vow, uh, and then the next step, it pops out a node. It's up to me to evaluate it. And then I send it in. It then figures it out. It actually then figures out the value and then pops it out with a stop iteration. There's a really kind of crazy uh, sort of control flow on this. But the idea, again, you know, here, you know, you have a binary operator with a star, two numbers. When you do this gen visit, it turns it into a generator. The generator is essentially going to emit the number objects, right? So like number three is going to come out, number four is going to come out. Um, to, to evaluate those, I'm going to send in the values, and then it will terminate with a stop iteration exception. This would be a good thing to bring up in like a code review, probably, uh, <laughs> this, this, this technique. So, so that, that, that's, that's what's going on. Um, and at this point, what I'm, I'm essentially doing is manually carrying out the, uh, the visit method of the other, of, of the number at this point. So you're, you're, you're going to do that. Um, and then to, to kind of piece the whole thing together, um, it turns out that you can employ a, uh, a computer science algorithms trick involving depth first search. Um, this will really test your, your knowledge of like an algorithms class. But it turns out that, that tree traversal, like recursive tree traversal, can actually be re-implemented by creating your own stack and then managing a stack instead. Um, and that is actually what I'm doing here, is I'm re-implementing the visit method to create a stack of running generator functions. And then what I'm going to do is manually add or subtract nodes on this stack, depending on like whether I'm going down into something or, or finishing something up. Um, and so what, you, what you're going to have is kind of this stack of running generator functions. And it turns out that if you do that, you'll be able to evaluate evil expressions like that thing that I just showed you. Um, uh, th 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 it's actually utterly amazing that this works. But you, can, you could take like that, that horrible evil text like that. You can say tokens is equal to um, you know, tokenize text. Tree is equal to parse of... Uh, parse tokens, there's your tree, and then uh, if, I'm, if I create this like new evaluator using this yield trick, uh, 
it actually runs fine, and it completely operates outside the recursion limit of Python. Extremely frightening um, kind of stuff going on there. But that, that is, uh, th I, 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 I sort of think that that is completely amazing, actually. I mean, it's, it, 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 essentially the only thing that changed here is that in this, uh, in this little node visitor thing, we're using the yield statement to not do recursion. We're sort of saying, no, I'm not doing the recursion. Somebody else is doing the recursion, but I'm not doing it. And then behind the scenes of that, there's a little bit of code that is doing an evil magic trick involving generators. Essentially running the recursion on your behalf using like a stack in the background. Again, kind of some pictures of that is, um, you know, again, you're, you're building up sort of stacks of generator functions. Uh, you're using yield as a, as a way of sort of dropping down a level. And then return values are coming back through stop iteration. Yeah. Cool. So, so how many of these actually got created? Uh, for, that, for that big parse tree, like 2,000. It actually did the recursion. But it did it in a different place. That's the, it's like it didn't do the recursion on the Python call stack. It actually did it in a Python list in a totally different place. And there's no index there? No. Memory. <laughs> Memory. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 I mean like, like if you wanted to take like that text and make it even more, like you could say text is equal to plus join, uh, you know, strx for x in range. I don't know, let's do 100,000, why not? Um, <laughs> you know, so, so, so you, can, you, can, you could do something along that line, and you could say tokeni tokens is equal to tokenize text. Um, tree is equal to, I might live to regret this, by the way. Um, <laughs> parse, uh, parse tokens, okay, cause, so it's kind of churning away on that. Um, again, this is like a 100,000 level deep tree structure <laughs> that we're doing here. And then, and then you could just say, well, okay, um, Actually, you should just say, well, evaluator visit tree. No, no problem. I mean, it's big, no, you know, it's like, it's so that, that did like a recursion, like 100,000 levels deep. <laughs> um, but not using the, the Python call stack. I mean, essentially, you use the yield statement to like escape the confines of the, uh, of the Python call stack, and now you're doing it somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let me, let, let me, let me, I think I have a slide on that. Um, I mean, the, the kind of the, the okay, so the, the general idea is that the yield statement is essentially pushing things onto this stack. Okay, so every time you do a yield, you're going down, down one level. Uh, if you look at the, at the code for that, let me, let me pull up the code again. Um, Okay, so, so here, here's kind of the stack, right? You have the stack of generators. Um, essentially, essentially what's happening is you try to send in a result using the, the send method, um, and then if anything comes back, whoa. Okay, so if, if anything comes back or if it works, uh, what, you, what you do is you just append kind of the, uh, the result on the stack. So kind of, kind of the idea here is you say, okay, send in something. If I get anything back, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it onto the stack and keep, keep on going. Um, if I have the, the stop iteration occurring, what's happening here is I, I, I pop something off of the stack. So I'm, I'm saying, okay, if it, if it stopped, I'm done with it. I'm going to take the value that came back, which is passed as part of that exception, and then I'm going to use that as the result that gets sent in as the thing to the previous generator. It's, 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 it's a really, uh, frankly, mind-exploding, insane thing to sort of, to, to sort, of sort out. But the, you know, the, the gist of it is you're building this stack up. And then um, as you drop down into this thing, you're kind of, you're kind of popping things, you're kind of pushing things onto the stack, and then the propagation of the results is entirely through these stop iteration exceptions. 
Actually, this would be a really good thing for a job interview, probably. You know, that's the, uh, <laughs> right, uh, so, so, um, so, 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 not the yeah question there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Did I use the the? If I use the yield from statement, then. Oh, actually, we I would not work work in Python two seven because the stop iterate you can't use the return statement. In 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 generator, so this is a. You could you could you could probably make it work in Python two seven through some other mechanism, but. Nah, I don't know. So. Pardon me. Yeah, maybe you might have to raise like an exception yourself and take care of that. So, yeah. So, so, so some final, uh, some final words on this. Uh, th th this is, uh, I don't know. I watched the movie Scanners before coming out here. So uh, another another Canadian art form there. Right? I think that I think that's a Canadian <laughs> movie. Uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, made me think of this. Um, a little bit of, uh, of, of maybe perspective on this generator stuff. Um, I'm not sure that generators were originally created to do anything that was contained in this tutorial. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but um, they always sort of struck me as starting out as like, oh, here's this cool way to do iteration. I think that's how most people got into generators. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. You can write generator function. You can make four, you can customize four loops. And, that, that's the kind of thing that got going in Python 2.3, thereabouts. Uh, and then there was this, uh, you know, this sort of interesting turn in Python 2.5, which is um, where the coroutine support showed up. That's actually where the send method, the throw method, the close method, um, all of that stuff got added in Python 2.5. And it enabled, um, enabled people to, to, to try to play around with some of these things like concurrency frameworks, you know, event lit, G event, coroutine based, like IO kind of stuff. Um, uh, it was it was sort of enabled by that the context manager decorator would not have been possible without that. So, uh, so you have this 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 kind of interesting turn there. Um, I would make the claim that the possibilities with generators goes way off the deep end with PEP 380. Like a lot of the stuff that we did in here today relied on the yield from in various forms or another. I mean, like all that future stuff was using yield from, this little recursion visitor pattern thing was using yield from. There's a lot of like uh, interesting stuff that opens up with that. I don't know, maybe it shouldn't have been opened up with that, I don't know, but it's uh, uh, really, really interesting uh, stuff got opened up with that. Um, the fact that you can bend control flow in this, in this way, it's really interesting. I mean, doing things with like wrappers and futures and concurrency and messaging and recursion and so forth, um, it, it frankly blows my mind. I mean, just it blows my mind so that, that you can do that. Um, I think the inclusion of async IO is a total game changer in Python. We actually have Guido in the VAC back. Do you think it's a game changer, okay. async IO? I think it is. Um, uh, the, um, you know, the, the thing that I find interesting about it is it's, at least to my knowledge, it's the only standard library module that uses this coroutine yield from stuff in any significant way. I mean, there may, maybe there's some other, uh, some other library out there that's using it, but the fact that this is in the standard library is a really interesting development. Um, and I think if you read the source for that, there's some really interesting stuff, like programming techniques going on in that. Um, I'm still kind of on the fence whether any of this is a good idea or not. I mean, I, I, I have to confess, like, you know, if somebody were to ask me, like, is all the stuff in this tutorial something that I should be doing in my production code? I have no idea. I mean, I, I, and one issue that, that I sort of think about is, you know, when you're playing around with this coroutine stuff, it does feel like it's kind of all in. You know, I don't, I don't know whether other people feel that way, but it's like if you start programming with coroutines, it, it, it feels like it's coroutines all the way down. You know, it's it's like an all-in kind of, um, you know, kind of kind of proposition. And and one of the things I kind of wonder about is it gonna is it gonna result in sort of two standard libraries? I don't know. You know, you know, could you have a, you know, could you have a, like a situation where there's kind of the Python standard library, and then there's this sort of other standard library that's all coroutine focused, maybe growing out of async I/O or some something like that. Um, you know, if that happens, you know, what are the rules by how they interact? You know, what's the interplay between there? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so new, so bleeding edge, I just don't know. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to sort of see how that, 
how that plays out. Um, another thing that I would just throw out there, sometimes people ask me, you know, Dave, do you write this kind of code yourself? And it's like, <laughs> I, I wish I could say that I do, but the code that I'm writing is so dreadfully boring. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like no meta classes and like, it's just like, oh God, it's just like update the database. You know, it's, 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 it's so boring, you know, so it's like, so the honest answer is like not, no. I mean, it's like, um, you know, I use generators a lot for iteration, but in generally, you know, I'm not doing crazy coroutine stuff. I mean, actually, honest answer is I tend to use threads for stuff a lot, like threads and recursion, partly because I can understand that um, <laughs> better than, than some of this other stuff. But I, I, I do think that, that there's some really interesting stuff with, with coroutines. Uh, a little bit more information is in the cookbook, although um, in, in doing this tutorial, I wish there was a whole bunch of stuff I added to the cookbook. Um, there's, there's like all this, like the, the, the honest answer is I don't think I fully appreciated the yield from statement in the cookbook. There's some examples of it in, in the cookbook, like, oh, um, you can flatten lists or something, you know, doing yield from, and, you know, kind of a couple of simple examples, but this, uh, you know, some of this stuff with, you know, with like futures and the async IO techniques, not in there, never even occurred to me that you could do that stuff until I, you know, read some of the, the source for things. So, uh, so, so with that, that, that's actually basically the end of the, the tutorial. I can sort of open it up for <laughs> questions if anybody dares, I guess. So, oh, oh special thanks, by the way. Uh, I did do a dry run of this about a week ago. Got a bunch of feedback from the, from the people there. And then also Guido for sending me the funny, the funny picture from earlier. Maybe I'll put that up again uh, in a little bit here. So, so Greg has a question. My other recollection from that time, too, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I want to make the claim that stackless Python with, like, Christian Tismer and those guys, they were probably, like, 15 years ahead of their time because they were, they were taught, I mean, I remember going to Python conferences, like, 99, 2000, somewhere, you know, and they're talking about coroutines and stackless. I, I honestly could not wrap my brain around it at that time. I mean, maybe it's just me, like I'm damaged goods from being like a C programmer or something. You know, I come from C programming and I remember going to talks where they're talking about all this stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, coroutines and green threads and all this stuff. And it was, I mean, it seemed cool, but it was just, it just way over my head. And it's like, in some sense, it, it seems like we're almost coming full circle back to those kinds of concepts and things that they were talking about 15 years ago. And Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty, I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting, interesting, fun stuff, so.
Let's see if there's other questions. Well, probably everybody's head has completely exploded at this point. But. No other questions. Uh, I have no idea. Do you know why the, uh, I'll, I'll throw it to, to Gita. Do you know why the regular expression scanner method is not blessed? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, there's an, there's an, there's an, un well, actually, no, actually, I think there is, I think there actually is a patch. I don't know whether I'll search for it. I know, I know that Raymond Henninger has malice towards it <laughs> for reasons that I don't understand or fully grok, but there's, now there's a secret undocumented method in, in the RE module that has been there, I think since 2.2, two, maybe, maybe even earlier, but it's, it's been like, 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 it's been like undocumented with malice, basically. Like, <laughs> we're not documenting that. Stop asking about it. As, yeah, I don't know why. I used it in the tutorial, of course. So it's, uh, <laughs> did I use it in the cookbook? Yeah. <laughs> yes, use your own recipe for it. Well, even better then. So <laughs> that's the, <laughs> it's documented now. Yeah, it has, it has to live forever now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I guess, I, I don't know. Thanks for coming. Hopefully it was uh, interesting in, in some way. I learned a few new things. Um, so I think we're going to, we have lunch. I mean. <laughs> yeah. I think like like ideas to try and understand this better. I mean, I I would definitely look at like the inline future stuff. The I, I, one one idea that I I think is really deep is this idea of being able to take anything and make it iterable <laughs> using the yield from statement. I mean, that's sort of a that's a really odd programming pattern that I don't think I fully kind of appreciate yet. I mean, it's. Oh, did I? Raymond's fault. Is it Raymond's fault? Yeah. Yeah. Found the bug. Ticket opened. Rejected by <laughs> Raymond. <laughs> 2009. <laughs> oh, did I did I run out of my? Uh... Oh, there it is. Okay, stop recording. <laughs> How you doing? Let me get off mic here. I saw I saw you come in in the middle there. So. Yeah. Yeah. What's your schedule besides zero free time whatsoever? Uh, I don't know. You going to the tutorial one? Uh, no, I don't have a ticket for it. And I'm going to go to the office and get a little work done. And then I'm I have to do a little work on my talk this Saturday. Generally, I'm you know, pretty open. Um, you, don't any, you want to do something? I mean, I, I don't have time to attend the Yeah, after, after like 3, 3.30, I'm free. Today? Yeah. I think there's like Stand if I don't see you. Hey. Yeah, yes. 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 There's something at seven ish tonight, yeah. I don't know what it is going to be. saying all the people on this list you know have tickets you don't need to do anything and then later on the same thread she said um, 
I haven't heard back from you people. Please respond. I haven't heard back from you. If you don't respond to me by a certain time, you're going to lose your ticket. I'm like, I muted the thread. You told me I didn't do, need to do anything. So I lost my ticket. Then I got it back. So somebody else took it. What kind of small furry animal do I have to threaten to kill to get you to come and do this as a tutorial at Pi Ohio? Um, I've been meaning to go. You won't say this, Ohio. <laughs> Columbus, it's like Chicago, but smaller, with less to do. <laughs> That's attractive, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let me think about something for Pi Ohio. All right. I don't know whether it would be a Well, yeah, I was trying to. Come do what you want to do. I just figured this would be easy because it's done. Thank you. That was very easy.